starting right now. Welcome everybody to MC Tune. Wait, to the to to Tunes Day Night. I'm MC Tune. Welcome to me. Uh, I uh, we were out at a restaurant, and I'm like, hey, can we get the? We gotta go. So, I made it just in time. So why buffering? Oh, you know, let me let me check. Oh, that's why. That's why. all right. That'll probably fix the buffering. All right, I gotta pull up. I gotta pull up the Zoom. Uh, cause Jaren is, Jaren is waiting for me. Uh, so, hey, how you doing? I hope you're going to enjoy what, what's going on tonight. It'll be, it'll be a little different than, uh, than a usual debate cause Jaren is moderating. Um, oh, there, there, there we are. All right. Let me get this going. Zoom. Sorry for the, for, for the lateness. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll do my best to make it worth it. All right. There, there's Brian. There's Jaron. I'll get them up on the screen so you can see them. <coughs> Zoom, Zoom meeting. There it is. There they are. How you doing, Brian? No, oh, oh, he walked away. <laughs> uh, I got this one. I'll bring it. Yeah, it sounds like sounds like you're right there. Also, one second. I see you guys. Sounds like they were also uh, uh, dealing with stuff. So, all right, let me see what we got here. We got uh, Stringer News One says, "Thank Titty Kaka. The show must go on." Indeed. Um, we got some others here. Hold on. Not that one. This one. The Grumpy Old Mechanic says there's $500 in easy money available to a select group of blurfs. All righty, Tune. Thanks for uh, making my initial, my debut night a success starting it a little late. Yeah. Sorry, right. your in case well, you don't know, your, your camera oh, is off. Me? Yeah, I can hear you. My mic? Hello? Oh. Yep. Makes sense on his show, probably. I hear you loud and clear. All good. Okay, good. And McTunes good. All right, good. <clears throat> Give me two minutes. We'll start. I just have to square up your guys' screens here. All right. And we should be good to go. I'll Where's mute me? myself. Oh, I'm muted to you. Where's yeah, don't, don't Hi there. start on time. What's up? What's up, Michael? What's up, Tim? Uh let's see. PhD Tony Are says Are you live already, Brian? I mean, oh he said that's why he said it. Okay, gotcha. I'm live, yes. Great. We will but be I'm, here one I'm second. selectively uh, muting myself to you. Okay. So just so you, yeah. All right. Thank you. We'll be starting in two seconds. Just get a square up your guys' screens. Brian, you're going to sit right there. Okay. Good. All right. Hold on. Hold, hold on. Let's do our introductions in a minute. I'm going to read a couple things here. <clears throat> Uh, PC Tony says two weeks ago, Jaron made some public false statements about me. I presented video evidence in his comments showing him what he said was false. Where is Jaron's public apology? Is he a coward, a hypocrite, a liar, or all of the above? What was the, I don't, I, what, did you post things into his, um, his comment section of his, of a video? Um, and did you verify that they went through? Because a lot of times links are held. So that'd be, that'd be good to, to go over at some point, I suppose. Uh, Earth Chan isn't flat. Who's been a member for uh, 11 months says for the millionth time, I am not freaking flat. Okay. I'm fairly well endowed. In fact, just watch them bouncy, bouncy, bounce, bouncy, bouncy, titty caca. Thanks for that. Dave Kircher. Says thanks to Decock, it's Tunes Day. Tip your server. I did. I tipped my server when I was at the restaurant. Uh Pronon 1990 is uh is a member. 
at Newton and had no no message. <laughs> they're, they're messing around. Uh, Pistina the first says, first off, an uninterrupted for a live stream. Oof. Hope I'm not speaking too soon. Finally, finally off. Hopefully, yes. There, there. <laughs> That's his intro. PC Tony says, is, <laughs> is Brian in a hostage video? We're not paying. That, oh my gosh. That is, that totally looks like a hostage video. <laughs> I'll ask. <laughs> Brian, blink twice if you're okay. Two blinks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's not a hostage video. Good news. <laughs> they they said... <laughs> Um, somebody said that you look like you're in a hostage video. <laughs> and G Giel, Giel Carlos says blink twice if you are being held hostage. Oh, he, he blinked twice. He blinked twice. All right. No, I'm not being. <laughs> All right. Is Jaren's intro roll still going? Can can Jaren's side hear me talk? Oh no, it says I'm muted right now, so probably not. All right, this is gonna be a fun one. Um, all right, how long is his intro, Brian? Oh, you can't. He can't. Brian can't hear me because I Jaren muted me on his side, which you know I was yapping. I was yapping, so. Uh, let's see. Is this it? I have, I have the stuff ready. Um, to go here. I got to make sure I pull it up. There it is. There it is. All my notes. I prepped everything. I'm a little scattered. Apologies. Yeah, there is a timer on the screen. I'll adjust that so you can see the... The timer a little better. Ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Houston, we, we have a problem. We don't need to see that stuff. We have a <laughs> um, all right. Let me get. Here oh, I got to take it, take it out so I don't hear. Because it's it's. What's going on, Russ? Jaren from Jaren is back with a live video for you. So, it is a first ever debateism. It's uh, it debating no, my way, I guess right you could spot. say. This was born out of a. I've got you know, so it's with most six debates different in that they uh, are topics long, that each of us present. Are not structured. If you think, if you look out, so it's, reason. it's a bit. And so what I wanted to do is present something a, a little bit more succinct. We're going to try and get you guys out of here things, in but each one is just a few. What say six fifteen? Just few. So seven forty-five. We should be done if we stick to the schedule, which I believe. We're going to do let me bring on the guys but by the way i should probably show you what we're doing tonight it is episode number one of debateism mctoon against uh brian leakey the shape of the earth is the topic let's go ahead and bring them on we've got the clock ready we've got both guys here let me take them off mute since i muted them uh because they were talking in the intro that was fun and uh yeah we're ready to go pretty much uh just to show you across the top of the screen so that you can kind of follow along with where we're at we're just going to do a quick welcome we're in the middle of that we're going to do intros, which will be two minutes each. Then we're going to do questions, which each of them has prepared three questions for the other one. So we'll go back and forth on that one with questions. Um, oh, that might be a problem. And then we'll do topics where they each are bringing six topics to the table. The way the topics work, they'll just bring it up. Uh, basically, whoever's topic it is, we'll say, hey, let's talk about this. And this is what I think or whatever. And then we'll get five minutes clock running on that one. And then we'll go to conclusions, two minutes each. And then if there's any super chats, we'll do those last. So let's uh, flip a coin. Uh, is that going to be a problem? I believe so. One second, I got to shrink this screen. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. All right, let's put it over here. I'm going to do a coin toss, and who wants to call it? Heads. Okay, well, we, that's Brian's calling it. <laughs> so let me uh, get over here, and can you guys see? Hang on, let's get this. Put it over here. All right, there we go. And I just want to be able for you guys to see it. And that's not going to work there. 
Trust you, Darren. We're going to cover McToon for a second just because it's fun. All right, and then we're going to flip. Here we go. And you called heads. It is? <clears throat> it is tails. So, Toon, you want to go first or you want to go last? I'll go last. Okay, that means you're up first, Brian. Go ahead. Whenever you're ready, you're doing your two-minute intro. And you're okay. up. All right, give me 30 seconds, man, because since this is the first show, I want to um, you know, give a shout-out to you. Oh, thank you. Um, I want to say thank you. I uh, feel like you know, you're filling a hole that's been left since uh, a long time ago when the Flatter Debate channel started. And then uh, I guess Ranty kind of filled that void. The Ranty begat Nathan, and then and then Brandon begat Ranty, and now you beget you begat Brandon. So you know a sizable. I want to say a a flatter channel. You know that's uh, respectable in size. Um, no disrespect to any of the other debate shows, but a YouTube channel. So um, we appreciate that. I think Globers and Flatters alike trust you, and hopefully, me and Tune will set the pace. Uh, I just want to ask him to keep it as honest as possible. I'm not going to try and bring an ego. I think if Craig is willing to submit to a point period, then we should be able to, and everybody should be able to. If he can humble himself, then Jaron and Craig kind of set the standard. So um, I, I'm just going to ask for demonstrations. I know you like numbers, and you know me, I like demonstrations. So that's what I'm going to be uh, asking for. But um, I'm going to I'm going to just keep it real. And this way we can police our own the way we used to. We can, um, yeah, we can police our own. And um, all right, that's it. Ready? I'll pass it. That's your intro? That was quick, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Good. All right, McToon, you're up. Your two-minute intro. Go ahead. Um, hey, thank you for setting this up, Jaron. Uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, it's, I think it's an interesting idea. And uh, I'm glad to be able to be uh, on the first the first run of it. Um, so yeah, let's try. It's, it could be an evolving thing. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but I think I like it structured. I like it, um, and, and I think people will learn a lot from each debate. In 90 minutes, you're going to get you know, like I said, 12 topics, three questions each. Uh, you'll at least walk away with understanding what both these guys' opinions are and positions. So let's see here, Brian. You're up first, and uh, you get to ask Tune. Uh, your first question. Yeah, Michael. So my first question is, um, is here uh, just north of where they launch, you know, in Jacksonville, Florida. They, um, some people, you know, me, I've actually uh, tricked some people and pointed, since I learned perspective, I pointed to the horizon, you know, when on a clear day when you could see an airplane fairly close to the horizon um, and said, look at this space shuttle. Let's check it out. And they was like, no kidding, man. You know, it, it literally looks like a space shuttle on a clear day where you could see that far going straight up for a couple minutes. Um, I'd like to uh, ask, how did your, I mean, how do you explain that in your model? Why does the airplane look like a space shuttle in the distance going straight up in the air? And then when it gets overhead, it gets straight. And then as it sets on the other horizon, it uh, it looks like a, something going directly straight down. How do you explain our... Uh, our local, you know, sphere of vision, for lack of better words. Uh, well, it was. It's not a sphere of vision, but uh, how do I explain that? That that is simple perspective. Every single uh, part of the path that that plane is taking um, can be explained easily with just solving triangles. Um, and if you you know you don't need to know any more the actual process of doing it. There are online calculators for it. So when a, when an airplane is, say, you know, I, I don't know how far away you can actually see an airplane. Let, let's say it's 20 miles, right? So when an airplane is 20 miles away from you and it's six miles up, right? Then you can, you can solve a triangle and you're going to say that that is a very low uh, angle, very small angle to the ground. When it's closer, say it's 10 miles away, that angle is going to be higher when it's directly above you. Well, it's, of course, it's going to be straight up. And then as it passes over you, it's going to reverse that same line of, uh, that it did on the way there. And so that angle is going to progressively get smaller. So it is a simple application of, of a perspective, uh, solving triangles. It's taught, um, 
at, in middle school, in, in high school, typically you're taught to do it with uh, actual sine, cosine, tangent. So. Right, real quick, uh, I know we're going to jump topics, but real quick, um, it definitely, the, my whole point in saying that, maybe I should have specified, was that it doesn't appear linear, and you don't see it, you know, 20, it, maybe 25 degrees above the horizon. It's not linear. Right. So it's, it's, it's an, asymptot so it's, it's an well, asymptotic the, relationship. Right. So it's a it's a squared relationship or whatever you want to call it, but it's pretty much you said no. perspective can just, no, it's it's hold not on, it it's not squared. If it's perspective arc, arc could tangent. describe it, then we'd see it coming up over the horizon at one degree. That's not the case. We see it at about eighteen to maybe twenty five, depending on how clear of a day it is. And for the first couple of minutes, it literally appears like it's going straight up. Um, so it's definitely not, it, nothing about it's linear um, or logarithm or anything you want to call it. Uh, Arc tangent. You know, I'll, I'll give some it's, examples. Hold on, hold on. Well, hold on. No, Let me be clear. Okay. Go ahead. We, we, we've gone off track already here, Jaren, but yes. <laughs> it's okay. I don't care. But um, I gave you the answer. It's not squared. It's not logarithmic. It's asymptotic. That's the word you're looking for. Use that okay, word. Okay, you're going with your, your question. Too. All right. My question. Uh, <laughs> what is the bottom-up obstruction prediction formula for flat Earth? Uh, non-existent? No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, I'm going to say, well, there's a couple ways really to do this, man. The first way we do is get the distance to the horizon. So... I think what Toon's looking for, and I'm a, like I said, I'm going to try and keep this as honest as possible, is that eight inches per mile squared is the, the you know, the measurement of the Earth, but it has nothing to do with the hidden obstruction. So I'm going to try and keep it real. And what he's looking for is the, uh, the formula. So, you know, you can get the, you have to start with the distance of the horizon, which is one way to do it is, um, is 1.22 times the square root of the observer's height and feet. And then you, apply you take that and then you apply um let me see i wrote it down so x would equal um a a squared minus two a d where a is the is the um obstructed height and d is the distance to the object plus d squared plus r squared minus r so basically there but you could also do it you know I've seen a couple of things where you could do R plus H where R is the radius. And I, I actually tried this and it does actually work. It didn't look like it worked, but R plus H, which is the radius plus the, the viewer height squared minus the radius of our squared in feet and uh, all that square rooted. It actually does work if you do these numbers, but um, you know, the real way that most people would do it too was uh, I would say it'd be like a, uh, It'd be G over O to the O G L times E. That's the way most people do it. Where G equals Google <laughs> and then the O O equals Earth Curve Calculator. And then the L E, of course, is type in your height and your distance, man. So that's how most people do it. Too. I'm just joking, man. Okay, your question, Brian. Go ahead. All right. So number two. Number two is right, hold on, Jaron. Write this down for next time. You need to give you need to give one like quick answer back for the next. Okay, next we can do that. Yeah, we'll do that. Do you want to give your answer? Yeah, we'll, we'll um, do it next time. I, I just, yeah, 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 absolutely. I just say all that was based on the globe. But okay, go ahead, Brian. No, go ahead and uh, respond to that. Was that what you that were was looking just... for, though? Like eight inches per mile squared? I was looking. The, uh... I was looking for the flat Earth formula, not for the globe formula. You gave me the globe formula. Oh shit! If you want a flat Earth formula, yes, that was the question. <laughs> it included four flat Earth in the question. For flat Earth, right? You Your goofball! Question, you goofball! <laughs> what the Bro, it didn't say nothing about it. Didn't say nothing about flat Earth because I've already gave you my uh, my my formula. It's ninety minus a over ninety times d times point A times one hundred of A minus one half A. 
where D is the triangulated distance to the sun or star, whatever you're this measuring. This is the bottom up obstruction. When something yeah, is right. when got, something is forty miles away, how distance. much will be obstructed? Oh my gosh. Ask your question, but okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'll uh okay. I, I put in a thirty second video to explain this, bro. I thought we were gonna be honest. You're a veteran, I consider you a veteran, but if I gotta reshow you this, I got a thirty second video for anybody who doesn't understand uh how the sun sets on the platter. I didn't ask how the <laughs> sun sets. Brian. No, we're not going to, we're going to go no. to the next, you ask your question now. We'll pass that one. Brian. Well, he interrupted me there on my formula. So I'm just saying, um, he's, he's, uh, what exactly are you asking for, man? You don't want my formula. He was looking for a, the bottom up obstruction equation for a flat earth, but let's move on to the next one. This is what I didn't want to do is get stuck on something. He didn't, that's fine. We didn't get an answer for that. What does he? Doesn't what does he think? Wait, wait, wait. What does he? What does he think I was giving him? Just like uh, you gave me the globe formula. <clears throat> no, I didn't give you the globe formula. Ninety minus a over ninety times d times point a times one half a is not the globe formula, bud. What's that formula do? I'm so. That's a refraction formula. Like I said, every flat earther might not agree with this, but this is just a. a pretty much a distance formula and then from there you figure the uh the obstruction hey, by doing when two, you, we can do this in the topics if you want but yeah. move on to your next yeah, yeah, question yeah. please thank okay you. yeah i'm not trying to not answer questions just so you all know gotcha so um hold on a second man one second yep what are we on his second one it's yes did I say ninety minutes? I meant one hundred and ninety minutes. You got it. You gotta love Brian. He's always Brian. He, it's got he's it, got always it. the same. You gotta love him. <laughs> All right, we'll get you the question here eventually. He just he's like oh, just a second. And he walks away. Yeah, I don't man. I'm sorry, man. It's okay. We're ready. It's so good. Okay, number two, man. Um, yes. Number two is let's say. How would you, with an auto level, pushing it to its limit, pushing it to about, let's say, 100, 150 yards per shot, how would you lay out a straight line? Uh, all right. Uh, let me read what, what I was sent, just because I answered what was sent to me. If levels curve, using an auto level and pushing the distance limits of 100 yards per shot, how would you lay out a straight line on land one mile long, your choice of elevation? My answer is I would hire a professional surveyor that has experience doing it and knows how and knows the process and ask them to plot out a one mile level line at constant elevation. Then either myself or mm -hmm. if the budget allows, ask them to also do a calculated elevation uh, above that, uh, based on based on the 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 globe known radius and how much it should be above that to be tangent to that point. So, for example, at one quarter of a mile, which is four and a half football fields, the the second point would be one half of an inch above that uh, measured level. At one half of a mile, it'd be all of two inches. And at a full mile out, it would be eight inches above the level line. Now, the difficulty is how, how would you, from a whole mile away, see that eight inches elevation change and just eye it and know how it's uh, useful? I don't know how that could be useful, um, but at least it's, it's, a, it's a little better oh. version than Brian Mullen's goofy thing where he thinks that he can build a perfectly rigid structure. So to get this straight, you, you would lay out uh, your straight line and you said you would raise above your horizontal two mm. inches. No, no, you, you in got the, in the first in the, sentence, you got it wrong. I would, I would yeah, hire a, 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 somebody that has experience doing it to lay out a level line, not a straight line. Level is a curve on the surface of the globe. No, 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 no. That's why I asked specifically for a straight line because they're yeah. going to give you the same thing. And, and, you I, gave you, and I gave You're you the get answer. The same thing. Just well, I'll give you the answer again. Step one, hire a professional surveyor 
to we don't need to, to lay we don't out need a level to line. Go back. He can go back and watch it again if he didn't hear it the first time. All right, got it. So go ahead. Your question number two. Um. All right. <laughs> How far away does the sun need to be to set over flat Earth? Okay, now you said flat earth, okay? There's nothing about flat earth. You're sitting here mucking with me and shit, and uh, there says nothing about flat earth in your first question. Nothing at all about flat earth. It says, what's the earth curve? What's the formula for, for hidden height? There's no hidden height on a flat earth as far as obstruction goes, you know? But anyway, I was trying to give you a formula. And uh, anyway, so... I'm, I'm going to refer. To, I'm going to refer to the way you answered as just uh, is there is there there is no uh, obstruction. So you're saying the sun never sets. The sun never the sun sets. Um, I'm a, You're going to use Jaren. I don't even want to just play my uh, Epi sunset video. Okay. We're going to play this, and we start the clock going. Epi sunsets. All right, here it comes. Yeah. So in case anybody hadn't seen this, I figured he's a veteran. And um, this is a white light and a green light about over 100 feet. And the door just closed to a warehouse and uh, letting cold air in. And the white light disappears right in front of the camera. And then the green light disappears. Now, here's the way they describe refraction. It ain't quite, you know, I'm not seeing shit raising up. This is the sugar tank experiment. But uh, for anybody who hadn't seen it, uh, with just atmospheric lensing or magnification, you have the sun dropping and setting and not changing size. So I thought we were going to keep this honest, uh, but you see the sun setting right in front of the camera, not change size on a flat earth. There's two ways that can happen, dude, with just cold air, with just a little magnification in the atmosphere. Um, you so, know, I see where this thing's going already, man. So I'm going to so, act accordingly. man. Yeah, I have a question. So then you're saying that the sun is literally on the ground? Because in this demonstration, the, the sun, your, your analog sun is literally on the ground here. So you're saying that the sun is literally touching the ground in reality? Nope. Oh. Did the sun touch the ground? Did in, the sun touch the ground in either example? Yeah, and your analog is right is right on the ground there. So, okay. No, I'm saying did it actually touch the ground, though, in either example? It, yeah, it sure looked like it was. Yeah. Did it reach zero? When it was just sitting above the ground in yeah, front of the camera. I mean, it looked like it looked like your analog setup that you had there had the sun right on the ground. Did it ever hit zero? Did did whatever Let's hit zero? Let's be honest, man. Did, did whatever either hit zero? Example, did either example approach zero? Did what approach zero? The sun examples. The white light in the first video or the picture of the sun. Or the flashlight in the second video. Did either of them touch the ground or zero? The horizon is zero. Yeah, it, it sure looked like you had placed the light or whoever had done it. and placed the light right on the ground. It looked like it. Yeah. But it didn't, though, right? Yeah. It didn't, though. But it, it did disappear, though, right? Yeah. So, so I, what I'm getting is that you think that the sun is literally basically right on the ground for flat Earth. That's what I'm getting. No, what I'm getting, what I'm getting is that the sun right in front of your direct line of sight disappeared. There's two examples of how it could work on a flat earth plain as day without the size changing on top of that. Yeah, so if step one, any... step one, put the sun on the ground. Step two, it, it disappears. Above zero. Okay, we got it, we got it. above zero. What's the, uh, ne who's up? Brian, I think you're asking your third. No, I think it's his, uh, Okay, if it's my third question, yeah. yeah, okay. My third question is, uh, okay, so um, how how in your model, and I know you have an explanation, man. Right, let's let's settle back down, too, man. I'm trying to get all shitty, man. I really ain't. Um, I'm sorry I misinterpreted the first question. It threw me off a little bit, man, but let, let's keep this real, dude. I mean, you should have yeah, been very... One. So next question is, um, so how would you explain in your model, you know, what would it take? For um for the crosshairs to block half a mountain and appear below the water horizon, uh, as exampled by uh by myself and by George Nacek's uh ice lake uh, measurement and by uh, Jessica Kozlowski and Tim Osmond's um Great Salt Lake Strong's knob uh, measurements at like seven foot above 
the Great Salt Lake. The so it's not that rare, and but how how does the globe model explain that? So so to be clear, you're, you're saying that I don't I didn't I'm not familiar with your particular example for you, um, and and I didn't look up Jesse and Tim's. Uh, I have seen George Natchik's uh, thing. So you're saying what you're asking is how is it that if you're a, a several feet above the water that the crosshairs can be below the uh, the horizon, right? Right. So we don't see in perspective the way you was trying to pass it off earlier, right? No, yeah. So so the the way and I mean this is a great example. So uh, you know when when light goes through a gradient a pressure or temperature gradient, it curves, and that curve has a radius. If that radius is larger than the radius of the Earth, then it will make something appear slightly higher. If that radius is smaller than the radius of the Earth, then it can cause distant objects to appear higher, significantly higher. So, for example, the horizon can appear higher, and, and I personally measured in March of this year, I went with this NIST certified thermometer to a lake near me and I measured the vertical temperature gradient. And at one to one and a half meters, it was a full degree Celsius temperature change. For the radius of the curve of the light to be the same as the radius of the earth, you need one degree in 10 meters. And this was significantly less than 10 meters. So that's causing the arc of the light ray to bend significantly more. So that's how you can see things above the crosshairs is because refraction can, can raise things that much in certain conditions. And so, for example, uh, George Natchik's uh, uh, lake example is a great one because, like I did, we know that at the bottom portion near, near the surface of the lake, that temperature gradient is pre pretty steep. Okay, McToon, your third. All right, my third one. What is the derivative of x squared with respect to x? Uh, may I give a couple different answers because I didn't quite didn't seem like enough information. But the basic okay. answer would be two x or one over x squared. Two, two or x. Or if you want to, I mean, if you want to take it a little bit further, though, if we're talking about derivatives, just for anybody who doesn't know, I'll make it this quick, Jaron. Mm -hmm. Is where uh, you're talking about the change. Basically, when we talk about it, we're talking about the change in the slope, um, like to a tangent or something like that. So, if you want to say, um, if you want to give it a value, like if it ain't squared, that means it's a constant, which means it's a straight line. So we could just use rise over run, right? But if it's uh, uh if you want to give it a limit, that's why I was kind of expecting something harder, like a limit. Like if you gave me two, I'd say as zero approaches two. You know, then I could have uh, done something with it. It was so simple. I thought he was trying to trick me, it's but I don't not, know. It's, it's not a calculus. trick question. I don't about right, right. I don't it's know. Really, about calculus, but... It's really just 2x. Right, right. 2x. That's all you had to say. All right. Hey, so we are good. Everybody asked all three questions, yeah? Yes. Okay. So, Brian, you get to name the first topic. Go ahead and make a little, you know, small, short 30 second statement, and then we're going to have a back and forth. If it goes well, we'll keep doing it. If not, I'm going to move it to 250 each. Or 2.30 each, I mean, two and a half minutes each. But for now, we'll start with open conversation with your first topic. Go ahead, Brian. Okay. Let's see. My first one, I'm going to say I wanted to see some uh, de uh, demonstrations for the, the, um, the way you were just describing that that radius the, um, with the refraction. Like uh, a demonstration would be nice. Uh, I showed the fish tank demonstration and how that works for a flat earth. If you could show me refraction demonstration for a globe, or if you could just explain the uh, the radius, the way you just described it as applied to that white light on the warehouse floor, uh, if you could just uh, if you could apply that explanation to that white light that's uh, about three inches above above the floor in line of sight, that would suffice, or any demonstration. Um. So, in in this part, you where I thought you were going to be bringing something, you're asking me to bring something? Well, I'm not, you brought yeah, the topic. Brought the, uh, you just brought the topic. White light. Okay. And, uh, you know, yeah. yeah. I didn't prepare anything. <laughs> I, well, well, I mean, I prepared, no, I, I I prepared it, I it, I six it. things for my topic. I got, I got links and web pages <laughs> and stuff to show. So I don't have... Right, well, show me a demonstration or just explain a demonstration. 
of, of, of refraction, not, not just numbers. Oh, all right. So, so if you, if you, I'll, I'll get, give you a little more detail in, in the uh, temperature gradient there. So you can read about this on, um, I don't remember the name of the page, but it's from Andrew Thomas Young at San Diego State University. It's some really good uh, description of how this happens and links to different papers analyzing it. And then I have on my website at mctune.net slash refraction, a, a list of empirical measurements of the temperature gradient and different conditions. So some have gradients measured, some have conditions identified. And the then the actual amount of, of uh, change in elevation that something appears to have because of that temperature uh, differential stack, right? Um, so the, the, the critical number is that the radius of the arc of light is equal to the measured radius of the earth when there is a one degree per 10 meters change in the temperature. And this is Celsius. Can you demonstrate that? Can I demonstrate? Yes. Uh, I, mctune.net slash refraction. There's a handful of different, uh, um, measurements of it. And there's specifically, I can, I can tell you the name of the one. I mean, it's just, it's just a paper and they're going over the details. So it's not something interesting to go to, to look at right now, but I can tell you the name of that one at least. And you can look it up. Um, it's on, it's on my page. I have a list of things I've read and then a list of other things I have right. not read. So this is the final one that I have read. It's called results of leveling refraction tests by the national geodetic national geodetic survey. So they took a bunch so of no demonstration. They, gotcha. No demonstration. Correct. Excellent. I did not prepare Excellent. anything for you, Brian. Because you're supposed to bring up a topic and then yeah, so he I'm messing with him, man. Okay. <laughs> so they, they took they took a handful of Invar uh bars and then they stacked. I mean, I can share my screen here. You can have a look. Um there you go. Can you see if I share that, do you see it? All right, hold on. I gotta, I gotta fix it on my side because people aren't seeing anything on my side at all. Um, Don't just tune into the better channel. Turn to my channel. Like you watch what? It hold on a second. I did. I do like that you said tune in. Uh, <laughs> well, I forgot to mention it's Tuesday night, isn't it? It is Tuesday <laughs> night. Uh, crud! I, I screwed up everything over here. Sorry, we've kind of gone so, off the rails already. So we, sorry. We, Yes, that's the case. Um, oh my goodness! Hold on, hold on, people. You're seeing. You're seeing. Oh, by the way, in the, well, yeah, I'll let you do that while yeah, I yeah, uh, tell talking. people real quick. If people want to, you can go to. Uh, well, the best place to reach out to me if you're interested in debating, if you want to come on the show, reach out to me on Telegram t.me slash jaronism. If you have no opponent, just message me and say, "Hey, I want to debate five G, or whatever it is," and then I'll put your name on my website. You can go to my website at uh jaronism.com slash debate it's not quite ready yet it doesn't have anybody's names yet but it does have a couple things people have said they want to debate and they're looking for opponents or the easiest method would be to already have your opponent in which case you just message me on telegram say hey me and jim are going to want to debate this and then we will get it scheduled and then you'll be on the show so it's that easy and uh bring your debate here if you'd like to get it over with quickly and yeah, these guys did exchange all these things beforehand, but you can do it either way. Either you guys can decide to exchange questions and topics beforehand, or you can do it blind up to you. Tune, you ready? I, I am ready. Okay, good. Okay, good. Right. So here is, here's an example of their setup here. They have these bars. Uh, these are Invar bars, which is a, a particular type of metal that is, is very resistant to, to uh, changing length and size due to temperature. And here is a, the stack of the um, the temperature sensors reading the different temperatures um, above above the um, the ground there. Um, so th that's that's the, the the really important thing of what they were doing. Then they did this. They set up this network. They measured the uh, difference in elevation due to uh, at these different locations. And uh, yeah, that's the interesting stuff. So anyway, that particular paper is is a real good one to look at if you're actually interested in like seeing how they do the um, the a controlled um, 
test of what what it looks like uh, what um, refraction does in the air so i mean that's the hey, demonstration topic, topic one for you tim all right hold on i gotta fix gotta fix this now it's okay hey jerry while he's fixing that will you look yep. at that first question man and see if uh if it mentioned uh flat earth I don't remember what it was. So I, I did not include flat earth in the wording. Okay. Um, There's your answer. So. Okay, thanks. So you by default win the debate. All right. You have it now, Brian? Well, you can't, you know, you can't win them all. Too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I kind of have already. So, so I mean. Well, now you got an L on well, the I right. Yeah. Saying I wanted to keep it honest, you know, and, uh, and I'm sitting there answering something you didn't even ask. And I apologize for that, but. But no, now I don't. Now I don't apologize. Anyway, all right, all I'm right. I fixed everything. I'm back to normal, and now now it's my turn. You know what? I should have just left it because I I need to show something because I brought stuff, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I brought stuff, but uh, all right, that's fine. I will. I will share it. Um. Okay. Jeez, there we go. All right, here we go. Here goes my topic. This is, hey, you know that that guy. You just thought your airplane, and you just like, oh, yeah, see the curvature? Yeah, yeah, I see it. Uh-huh. Fine, take a picture of it. Put it back on your whatever screen. Hold up some sort of straight edge to it, you know, like, like this thing right here. Hold up straight edge to it and tell me if it's still flat. If it is, great. Send me that picture. I will quit Flat Earth tomorrow, and you'll be famous for, for getting me to just ditch Flat Earth. There you go. So I, I did. I, I did exactly that. I sent four of them to to uh, Mark Sargent. I'll just cover them now. And Mark, Mark isn't here. I, I, Brian, you don't speak for Mark. So I'm just going to show show what I what I sent to Mark. Um, so here is here is a picture of the horizon from an airplane at forty six thousand feet. Here it is at the top of the screen. Here it is at the bottom of the screen showing that it's not fish eye. Uh, lens or a heavy distortion of the lens um, could it be the cockpit I want you to it uh, it can't be the cockpit because th this was from Wolfie uh, he found in his hangar there he's got this bar that's curved and he's got this bar at the bottom that's straight and he went inside of his plane and inside his plane through that very same cockpit that curved line appears curved the straight line appears straight so we have a, a, a strong control there. Curves lines are still curved and straight lines are still straight. So it can't be that yeah. it's being manufactured by the lens or the canopy. Um, and then to further what. one more step, hold on, I'm almost there. One more step. Yeah, yeah, Walter yeah, Bislin, Walter Bislin analyzed based on the elevation and the camera, the specifics of the camera. He analyzed the globe prediction for how much curve you should see. And this is it here. They match right on there so the predicted curve for the globe and the visible curve match when accounting for the uh specifics of the camera so all right there you go okay well uh one of my questions or one of my topics was uh compressed horizon curvature so if it's okay with jared i'll just make a quick comment to defend mark Sargent, and uh and we can speed it up because uh it pertains to this exact uh thing if, if that's okay i was gonna say that uh I, uh, would you agree? If I'm gonna defend Mark, would you agree that he's asking for uh, for Earth curve? Yes. Right. And um, would you uh, would you call that Earth curve? One hundred percent. Why is it showing straight and then it's showing curve? But uh, so if it's... I'm looking straight out in front of me in that airplane um at a level horizon so we're not talking fish eye lenses we're not talking about uh mountains on one side we're talking about a fairly even horizon uh in all fairness and uh so you would agree that if it's uh four degrees straight ahead then uh off to the right it's also going to be four degrees and then all off to the left it's going to be four degrees and then if i turn around it's going to be four degrees as long as the horizon the landscape is relatively level. I'm going to have a, a four degree drop no matter what I'm on ball, flat, whether you compress it, whatever the case, right? So, I, not I, earth curve. 
I, I have no idea what you're talking about. I showed you the predicted predicted Earth curve that Walter Bislin did, and it matched the what what was seen from the airplane. So I, I don't know exactly what you're talking about with this four degree thing. Well, my question is, is if I have a level horizon, every direction I look, whether it be globe flat, is going to be the same degree drop every direction I look, right? Well, that was not... I wasn't showing the Different linear point. drop. I wasn't showing the dip in that one. I was showing the left and right curve in that one. So it's a different, different right, topic. You'd agree that off to the right, if it's four degrees straight in front of me, off to the right, it's also four degrees. I, I what what four deg what is four degrees measuring, Brian? The, the, this drop you're talking about, okay, or the drop we can measure, we could call it two degrees, whatever you want to call it. It's an arbitrary number because it does change constantly. So my point is, is if I look straight out ahead and I can see 200 miles and it's a two degree drop, if I look to the right, I'm also going to see 200 miles in a two degree drop. And if I look behind me, I'm going to see 200 miles in a two degree drop. Even if the Earth's a globe, I'm not going to see Earth curvature. I'm going to see the same degree drop every direction I look. Right? Why are you talking about the the front the the linear drop? I'm I'm showing a curved horizon. How many degrees of curvature is it then? So let's say it's two degrees straight out in front of me. What is it to the right and left? What well, you keep you? Why won't you stay on topic? I'm You're showing the left to right curve. I'm asking you to explain it in degrees. No, I'm I'm explaining to you that <laughs> Walter Bislin did a pre, a specific prediction of what it should look like for the globe, and it's not a two degree something. It's the left to right you're curve that you should see on the globe, and you're talking you're about the linear <laughs> the linear dip. Hey Brian, go ahead. You're up next. Your topic. Yeah, that's tough. Okay, so um. I wanted to say two things, okay? Um, uh, he, I didn't bring the video for all this, but um, uh, I'll explain it. So a helium balloon in a vacuum. Okay, a couple things. Okay, they say that, you know, that it's pretty much, they say gas has mass, so it's attracted to the Earth. And we claim that, no, it's not. Like, even a helium balloon in a vacuum, um, you you got to use a real tough balloon, but um, Action Lab pulled it off and he used some real strong water balloons and he was able to get a couple of them not to pop. And uh, so as the pressure in, uh, decreases in the vacuum chamber, that increases the pressure in the helium balloon. And so it hits a point where it it can't support the weight of the balloon anymore and it just it kind of drops down. It doesn't like fall at free fall, but... Uh, and he shows what, how much air is left in there. And it's about, you know, about enough to fill a, a size of a quarter. And, uh, and so my question would be this. Uh, well, two questions. One, shouldn't it, if the buoyancy equations are accurate, shouldn't it have, uh, like kind of eased down? Shouldn't it have hit a point where it was like halfway the way we see it in air? And, uh, number two, um, can you justify the amount of that tiny bit of amount of air left in there for it to ever fall at the same speed as a lead ball? In other words, in my opinion, it'll never, if I drop a lead ball in the vacuum chamber in that helium balloon, it's not even going to be a contest. The, the helium balloon is going to ease down and the lead ball is going to haul ass down. Is there enough air, that tiny bit of air left in that vacuum chamber? You think it's enough to justify that, that slow rate? It all right. So you you have you have guessed that in a vacuum chamber, you guess that a helium balloon would not fall at the same rate as something that was much more dense. I'm going to say I'm going to need more than your guess. But yes, uh, in a in an evacuated chamber, a helium balloon is no longer buoyant, so will fall. And that and Action Lab did a good job there. Um, I'd, I'd like to see it done with a, a mylar balloon because that they don't uh, stretch like latex or other balloons like that. 
So I, I don't quite know what you're talking about. Things still fall, uh, helium balloons still fall in a vacuum chamber. Uh, they, they lose their buoyancy. And so, yeah, when you do the math, you actually apply the buoyancy formula. Uh, you do find that helium balloons do what are predicted in a gravitational field. Okay. Any other but questions on that one? Or we, we, yeah, we don't well, have just wanted, so we don't time in, so in our three minutes to, to yeah. You're, so your answer is that little bit of air left with uh, that little bit of air is uh, is enough to uh, to slow it down where it doesn't fall at free fall speed. Th that That's little, fair enough. No, hold on, hold on. Don't put words in my mouth. What little bit of air? The little bit of air in the balloon, or the little bit of air in the vacuum chamber? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You've seen it. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm saying that uh, that you, you agreed with the buoyancy equations. You didn't like answer my question. Brian Meyer. Yeah, yeah. Well, Bryant Meyer said that. Uh, you know, he he said that up high, things. He said he was thinking strictly math, and he said things should fall faster up high because the, there's less atmospheric pressure. But uh, he said that ain't the way it works in the real world. He said that when he was debating Austin. And I played it in Globebusters a few Sundays ago, and uh, but he's wrong. Wouldn't you agree that things absolutely do fall faster up higher due to the fact there's less well, air pressure? You've, you've, air brought, you've brought another thing into it here, though. You've brought wind resistance into it. Right? It's no longer just buoyancy gravity. It's now buoyancy gravity wind resistance. So when you're at high elevation, there's less air. There's less wind resistance. So your your velocity can be higher. I'll tell you what. I'll send you a clip, and uh, if if uh, if what I'm saying is accurate, which I believe it to be, then you could correct him on that. I'll talk to Mark Sargent, and uh, you talk to Bryant Myers on, on yeah. that one. Because look at us getting things, things done. <laughs> things do fall faster up up uh, at altitude, according to uh, you know the let's be say the Red Bull jump because of wind resistance, not buoyancy. Yeah, it's a change wind in wind resistance. Right. resistance. Right. He said that, uh, you know, you would expect that to happen due to wind resistance. But yeah, uh, he said that we don't. He said that we don't. And I disagree. And I think you do, too. OK. Uh, Tune, I think you're up. All right. I'm going to share. Share my screen. Uh, I have a ten thousand dollar gravity challenge that i've recently more recently than the other challenge that you might have heard of um issued this was uh, actually this is this is my very first challenge i issued this with the money that i won from flat out hero but this one i this is now backed by my own bitcoin the uh, the challenge is to beat gravity at its own game and to uh to do to predict the specific magnitude of the downward acceleration for different areas on the earth because we know that the value changes it's about 9.8 meters per second squared but it's not exact and it varies from a, from 9.7 to almost 9.8 depending on location so i have that challenge there on my website and i have how i actually do the, the my prediction for the globe so all you need to do is you, you provide the mechanism for that and how to predict the specific amount. And you do that for five locations, IGSN locations. They've already been measured. You don't have to go do anything. You send them to me along with the formula. I'll pick five IGSN measurements. And whoever has the smallest error out of those 10 wins. If you're right, you win 10,000. If you're wrong, you lose nothing. So I use uh, yeah. the uh, law of gravitation formula there and I use the second law of motion there and I, I give a specific places uh, where I've done examples for how I've done it so right here we have Kauai Hawaii where it's 9.787 and here Fortaleza Brazil which was where um, one of the Eddington party went in 1919 it wasn't Eddington it was a uh, Campbell I think anyway and uh, Fortaleza Brazil there you go 7.8 uh seven nine point seven eight and then up in uh, international falls near me nine point eight zero eight so those are the ma measured amount and here's the predicted amount so the predicted amount and measured amount is very close there's the actual amount that it's off so all you need to do is do that for whatever you think causes things to go down and uh and do it better than gravity you win ten thousand 
What do you think? Okay. Well, I, I sent Jaron something to play, but um, instead of that, I'm just going to um, give a brief description of it. And uh, that's that's cool you put your money up, but I, to be honest, I'd like uh, the, the way you formulated that challenge, like you, you pitted it against literal nations worth of data and stuff. And, uh, and you said that we can't use kinematic equations. Okay. So we have to come up with a cause, but we can't use mass or any form of mass or any constant. And I'm thinking, well, no, I'd you, like can, to see you can use a constant. You just have to show the derivation okay. of the okay. constant. Fair enough. Okay. Well, ain't that oxymoron kind of, but no, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Um, but I'd like, oh, so you want to see you want to uh the cause explain so i, I want to put you through your own challenge what what's the cause in your model and uh this law of gravity you speak of um you, you are you speaking of newton's law m1 times m2 over r squared yeah I, I and you're it. using the g constant yeah i had it on the screen there yeah so how did how did uh so newton knew the constant then right since it was a law newton must have knew no, Newton did not know the constant. No, he just he just put together the formula. So he just copied the uh, the Coulomb's law then, and then later on, oh, hold, hundred hold on years a later, they Br came Brian, up with the constant. Brian, that Coulomb was born after Newton. It was wrote, ten years published. before Coulomb. It was ten years before. What was ten years before? Coulomb came before. Before the law of gravity. Oh, are you, are you yeah. sure about that, Brian? Yeah, yeah. Can you tell me who came up with Big G? Hold on. What Newton was? Hold it? on. You didn't change. You changed the topic there. All right. Let, let's look at. Are you talking about just the formula, or are we talking about Big G, and and what a Coulomb is? And, I'm and talking the about the law is? of gravitational attraction. Big. So it's it's uh, Big G. Uh huh. Times M1 times M2 over R squared, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. So, so big G wasn't that Reverend Michelle and Cavendish? Well, Cavendish was was, is credited as the first one to measure big G, but Newton came up so with the Newton law gave, long before Cavendish. How can he have a law if he doesn't even have the full equation? He had the full equation. He just didn't if have didn't the have value for, for one of the variables. So he had basically Coulomb's law without the constant, without the electrostatic constant. But but I don't know why you're bringing Coulomb's law into this. Coulomb's law came after. You why, are saying that. Why are you? you hold you, on, Brian. Brian, I just want to make it really clear. It's not possible that Newton copied Coulomb's law because Coulomb's law came after Newton. What's Newton's law? F he doesn't have the value equals for G. G, M1, M2 he over R G. squared. He didn't Don't have to have it to, to create the law. So he just had an equation. Yes. Max yes. Coulomb's law without the constant, right? It was before Coulomb, Brian. He didn't have big G. What are you talking about was before Coulomb? He didn't have a, a constant, period. He can't have a law. If you don't have the equation, yes, you, yeah, Dude, yeah. So I can, you actually can. So I can invent a law right now, and just just give a squared function, and I've invented a law. You could, and then and then people would test it and see if it works, and if it doesn't work, they'd say oh, that didn't work. So, sorry. Okay. So yeah, yeah so anybody can come mean? up with any hypothesis they want any day. They can chuck stuff out there all day long, and as as Feynman said. You can you can guess. A guess is a perfectly fine way to come up with a hypothesis. Well, you at least concede that Newton couldn't apply his law. He did apply it. He he derived it from Kepler's laws. But he couldn't apply it because he didn't have big G. He, he didn't have yeah. But there's ways. There's other ways that he worked through these things. But in your challenge, we can't use them. We can't use anything kinematic. We have to come up with a constant and all that stuff. But uh, my point is, is that Newton, you're, you keep calling it uh, Newton's law of gravity. Yeah, he, I, it's, it's not me I, that, that coined that phrase. That's been the name for centuries. Well, police your own, please. Well, they're correct. <laughs> it's the name. 
And it is the name, and it's correct, because nobody's found it to be wrong yet. <laughs> nobody's hey. found, nobody's give a cause. That's not, that's not how so you what? test a law. You test a law by seeing if it works. You don't need to know the cause for a law to be a law. Yeah, but in your challenge, you want us to tell you a cause, so I would... Yeah, you're, that pro you're proposing you. something else. Your cause. Well, I'm asking you, what's your cause? Mass attracting mass. Yeah, mass attracting mass. Okay, that's that's dead. Okay, that's it, that's not instantaneous, is it? It, it doesn't change anything. It's not <laughs> been found to be wrong. This and this is your opportunity to get paid to. to so we be don't need Big G it. then. So I don't need Big of G. Of course, then, right? you I could use not be using. Equation. You could not be using Big G because that's gravity's thing. You are proposing something other than gravity. So why would you want to use gravity to disprove gravity? That seems so a little self-defeating. Well, you admit Cavendish had had almost a century to look at the equation and fit a, and retrofit the constant. He had almost a century. Yeah, to retrofit Big G. What do you need to model? retrofit Big G? He measured things. Well, you can't. You can't come up with big G if you don't have mass or a, a certain volume. But but I'm not asking, Brian, okay, I'm not you asking get... you to produce big G. I'm asking you to produce the downward acceleration, a completely different thing. Okay, let's go to the next topic. So you don't need to... All right, so you don't Who's need to code. Okay. <laughs> this is fun. All right, keep... so... Who's up? Is it Brian? Brian, yeah, re yeah, okay. read it again, because you're, yeah. you're not... I think you're you're confused about what I'm asking for. Well, you call it a law of gravity, and I've, I've got a problem with that. I think you should... Uh, then then should, disprove uh, it by pro it. producing the other thing. Oh, you don't need to worry about what I'm doing. You need to worry about what you think is causing the downward acceleration. Like I said, I'm trying to get this uh, everything honest and everything. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll go through with it. So um, uh, locally lit clouds, um, I must say that with, in the heliocentric model, the sun is supposed to be 93 million miles away. Yet, with the sun and the moon, we see locally lit clouds. We see uh, hot spots with uh, where there's no water around. And uh, one of my main points is that, uh, you know, it was thrown at me that the sun putting a shadow up on the bottom of clouds or, or lighting up the bottom of clouds was some kind of proof for a globe when in my... Uh, Earlier, I showed how, how it works just with atmospheric lensing. But uh, if we're going to use the trigonometry, if a sun is one degree above the horizon, that means it's 1,600,000 feet approximately. I mean, 1,600,000 miles above the tangent of my feet toward the horizon. So it's way above the clouds. So if a sun, I've showed uh several but i've showed the sun up to like four or five degrees still lighting up the bottom of clouds now how can a sun that's that's millions of miles above that cloud be casting light on the bottom of that cloud it, how's that possible because it, it's not millions of miles above that cloud that's easy okay so you disagree with the trig that that a, a sun yeah. one degree above the horizon okay 93 million miles away puts it Puts the opposite side at one million six hundred thousand miles. You disagree with the simple trig? You, you did not show any trig, so I'm not going to agree or disagree to any trig that you you're referencing. I've not seen it to agree or disagree with it. All right, I can pull it real quick. But oh, I can wow. I can draw a diagram. To, yeah, to show you put in one degree. No, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, miles. I'm not putting in a degree. I'm just I'll just draw a diagram here. And it's it's not to scale. Well, in your mind, you should know it's going to be but well closer over a million just just from the numbers themselves, you know. All right, here we go. Here is here's that's the Earth there, <laughs> right there. There's the Earth. There's the Sun oh, off yeah. off page there, right? And here it is coming up to hit the bottom of the clouds. See that? That's pretty yeah. good. I even used yeah, a straight edge. Yeah, how's that work? Now, now that works pretty it's well. Funny. But here's what here's what I don't get. How high how high is the highest uh, normal cloud, Brian? 
I don't know, a few miles maybe. About about six miles. Why? But why? Wait. Why are you failing to answer questions? Um. You do you disagree that uh that ninety three million miles distance, the height of the sun, one degree above the horizon, would be roughly one million six hundred thousand miles. I'm not. I you you you're gonna have to show your trig for me to do it. All right. Here is here is for flat Earth. I I, oh, I don't know how this works, but that's quite amazing. That's how I think you're going to have to you. explain it. We're off to a bumpy start because I just showed you in the first video with just a little bit of lensing, like they say, the atmosphere of the lens. We backed the sun away; it disappeared, so, and it hit the bottom of the so, cloud. So you think? You think? So how high is the cloud? How high did you measure the sun to be? So I can demonstrate something, and in the same debate. You pretend you didn't even see it. How, how I literally high, demonstrated it. Brian, Brian, how high is did you measure the sun to be over flat Earth? Let me pull the trig for you, man, because I'm not going to let you weasel out of this one. <laughs> you want me just to show that again? Your video or no? I don't know if you want me to show that again. Yeah. One second, Jared. One second. I didn't think you'd have, uh, I didn't think you'd argue the simple fact. But um, I'm just going to show, uh, you know what? Uh, couldn't you just you couldn't you just take the circumference of the orbit of the sun and then divide by 360? If you want to get one degree. Yeah, I'm just going to show this real quick. Uh, he wants to see the trig, so I'm just going to take a snapshot and send it real quick, if that's okay. And he, and he can ask his question if, if you like. Uh, I, I skipped the question because I joined my uh, – my condensed horizon earlier so that's up to you but i'll take a quick i don't this, this was important to me so i thought we were going to keep this honest and i don't feel like it's uh we're... so you're showing the trig right now for your distance above the tangent brian is that what we're looking for is he I think that's what he's, doing. he's focused. Right. He's focused on something. Focused. He's getting you the trig. Um, you, you know when I spoke to uh, um, Flatsoid, he was going to show me trig, but he never did. And then he'd point at something and he go, "There's the trig formula," but it was just plus and minus, and multiply. There was no trig. I'm like Flatsoid. There's no trig there. That's not a trig function. No, and here's the trig function. No, that's not a trig function. He goes, "Oh, but Sokotoa." Do you know what that means? <laughs> well, yeah, it's Sokotoa. <laughs> but 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 what's that mean? Well, it's for triangles, and that's a triangle. And I did the formula there. Oh, thanks, Flat. So like, good job. That's a good boy. <laughs> that's no. Brian, you looking for the trig or what? If he can hear me anymore, or what happened? I don't know. All right, we can move on to the next one until he's ready for that one. He can show you the trig after. Yeah, yeah. All right, that's fair. But Brian, you can hear us. I don't know what happened. Maybe he's off the tab or something, so it's not listening. Um, <laughs> we will give him one I, second. I'll ship him. I'll ship him some of my tab, so that he oh, can don't be. Do that. He can that's be terrible. on the tab. You know what's in that stuff? You know, if you drink one of those a day, tune just one a day. In thirty days, you have added a five-pound bag of sugar. In tab. How did yeah. they? How did they get sugar in ta sugar free tab? Oh, is it sugar free? I'm talking about. That's I, the I'm point, that's the point of tab. Oh. It's sugar free. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I did not know that. Yeah. My bad. I was they, thinking it was a Coke, but now you just got uh, fake sugar, which is even worse. So, do, do you know what? Uh, do you know what fake sugar is in tab? Svedia or whatever stupid stuff is. I don't know. No, no. What is it? It's saccharin. That's the one. That's the the one in the little pink packets at the restaurants. I wouldn't touch those. That's that's the one I I, I do prefer saccharin of the artificial sweeteners, though I generally don't like those. This though, the the tune shine, that's the good stuff. Uh oh, there you go. Brian oh, can you hear us. Do do I look? I look more sophisticated. Watch this, pinky up. Wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> I've got. Uh, do you have any thermoses? I'm very impressed with thermoses keeping things cold. I do have a thermos. It's in the other room. Amazing. I can leave it out in the car and it's hot and it will stay cold. Yeah. It's insulative. 
Brian, do you see us? Are you there? Are you coming back? <laughs> okay. This is the longest snapshot of Trig ever. And I did really well of keeping everything five minutes very very packaged nicely. So um, somebody here is asking, could you ask Jaren's thoughts on stevia leaves as a sweetener? Yeah, I think it's probably the best that you can use, I guess. Yeah. But I don't like... Uh, you gotta stay away from that process stuff. It's killing everybody. It's why everybody is so damn fat. Um, <laughs> Requiem for a dream says I only do artificial sweeteners because they help me poop. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. I'll tell my wife in case she has that problem. Um, Brian, are you there? Does he see us? What is going on here? What happened? I don't, is is he must be on a phone? I'm not sure. Oh my. He's a strange one. I mean, I like yeah, Brian. I'll step in. I like Brian. He's so goofy. I like Brian. Um, you on the other hand, what? <laughs> Gosh, the tough crowd, um, man. It's a tough crowd. Um, I don't okay, know. Go ahead name your next topic, and we'll see if that brings him back. I don't it's, know. It's his. Well, I mean, it's his turn. What is he trying to find the trig of of saying that it was a million plus miles? So is that was it? Couldn't you take it? Because what it is now, I don't remember what his number was. It was like one point something million. Yeah, he, he was he was applying the angle and then and then the solving a triangle, I think, to get the okay. the, oh, the height of the other side of the triangle. Couldn't you but just take the, the orbit of the sun and then uh, that's five hundred and eighty something, right? And then take that, divide by three sixty, and get one point something million. I think that's all that he was saying, but I'm not sure. I posted the. Um... The trick, but, uh, in Telegram, it's just uh, you said the it's calculator. me. Calculator. Oh, Telegram. Yep. It's I'll, just uh, I'll it. uh, okay. So I'll I just put it. in for theta. I put in for theta one degree because uh, the horizon is uh, considered zero. We could do half a degree or a quarter of a degree. Doesn't matter how you want to do it. You put in one degree with a ninety-three million mile tangent in outer space. And you I, get an opposite side height of one million six hundred thousand miles. Okay, I get what you're doing. I can, I can, I can explain it with my diagram here. Hey, right, here's know. here's the diagram. So when when uh, the observer is is there, they're they're sitting somewhere here. I'll show you. Right, they're they're under the sun somewhere. You see that? Make sure I can see. Right you disagree here. with the with the trigonometry? Just then? a second. Just a second. They're sitting under the sun there. See that? So the tangent to that person, this is not to scale, of course. So don't, don't be Hold on, if I thing. raise up above oh, the he's clouds, show up. Let's wait. Yeah, yeah, okay. So there's the tangent for the person right there. And so we're looking at a, a theta there is negative, not positive. So okay, the, so if I go up so the above sun, the clouds, the sun is below the clouds in this instant. If you, of when you're talking about the tangent there, not above. Very good. So if I go up above the clouds, then that, the sun's going to follow me up, right? So if I go up a hundred uh, thousand miles, the sun's still going to be at a tangent to my feet, right? It's still going to be one degree above the tangent of my feet, right? Way above the clouds, right? It, it was I'm never. Let you warm out of this one, the, the, It was never above your tangent it was always below your tangent right below. it was no it's one degree above my tangent yeah but but in this example that where, where you're looking at clouds lit from above or from below you're over here seeing that looking up and so seeing you, the clouds do you disagree with a triangle calculator saying one degrees above the tangent of my feet when I just exampled, if I go above the clouds, the sun's going to follow me up. In fact, Brian, it'll follow me up Brian, all the way to the Brian, moon. Brian, I'll, I'll say it only one more time. I disagree that the angle is above your tangent. I say the angle is below your tangent. But the, the, yes. just, what if I'm on isn't the moon this dark? And I have the, real quick, what if I'm on the moon and I have the same exact angle damn near as I had on the ground? A one degree shadow casted. I put a one meter stick in the ground. I've got a, uh, a about a 28 meter long shadow casted down one degree. If I go up uh, uh, 20 miles above the clouds, I've still got a downward one degree shadow, right? If I go up a thousand miles, I've still got a downward one degree shadow. 
and you're disagreeing with the with the freaking triangle calculator. I mean, I know I said I was only going to say it one more time, but I'll say it yet again one more time. Right, we're talking past the, each other. Let's go to the next one. Good, Tune, go ahead. Got it. Right. Unbelievable. So I, uh, in addition to my uh, $10,000 gravity challenge, I have uh, the the year and a half old um, challenge. And I've had really just one. Uh, I've had two. Uh, and Weisskopf is in the, my live chat here. But uh, Brian, you are the only one, really, that I think, because Weisskopf didn't quite, I don't think you quite got what he was doing. You're the only one. That that has some sort of a, an attempt at this, and and I appreciate your, your response. I'm trying to keep it real, man. I, I appreciate your, yeah, your response. I said I said I, I don't think it's I don't think it qualifies because you use the globe, um, but I just want to say, uh, just put it out there that uh, the, the the point of the gravity or the sextant challenge is to show how to do celestial navigation using only flat Earth. And again, like in the gravity challenge, any numbers you use, you need to show the derivation. So if you use sixty nautical miles per degree latitude or per, per degree uh, from the, the GP of the star. You need to show the derivation of that, right? I can show the derivation of that for a globe because of the constantly changing angles. I do the math. When I do the math for flat Earth, I see that it must be an arc tangent, but, I, but that's not the relationship that we see in reality. So I don't know where it would come from, and I, that's simply what I'm asking for. But again, the point is... Um, uh, I, I, I have the, the, uh, the three angle measurements to the stars and the challenge is to provide the process of doing celestial navigation using only flat earth. And then, uh, you do that if you're within 25 miles, which is very generous. Um, then I'll send you a second set of, of, uh, stars and you set, you run the same process. Um, and I, and part of the reason, and, and I think like the Oakley guys for, they don't quite understand why the reason why I say you only need to be within 25 miles is because you don't need to then include refraction or dip angle. I made it super easy. And, and, you know, when flat soy, it's like, well, dip angle, dip angle. And Brian's logic is dip angle, dip angle. Like you don't even need to worry about that because 20, yeah, with, with a 25 mile slop, you don't have to worry about that. Anyway, here is, yeah, here's how I it's, agree with that. Here's how it's done on the globe. This is the three uh, stars. There's the one there, this little like cone thing that you see on the screen there. That's the GP of one star over on the right side is another down at the bottom is another. And then there's a circle of equal elevation drawn around that. Those, uh, those three points, the GPS, yeah, this one here, let's see how big, that's a giant circle there. And then this one here, that's kind of just underneath Iceland. The circle goes around there. Is it orange, I think? Anyway, where those three circles meet, that is the point of the observer right there. And if we get close enough, we'll find the, the, the uh, as usual, they don't exactly overlap because there's, there's nothing perfect in meat space. So there you go. That's, that's how it's done. So I'm not doing something that I can't, that I can't do. Um, so yeah. Anyway, Brian, this, what, uh, what do you think? I can see this. I had a lot of fun on that show. It was a, a good show. Um, I will say that, yeah, the, the refraction correction dip angle is, is a, a very uh, minimal um, correction. I'll agree with you on that. Um, for re I, I'll say that um, I don't agree with the read. I, I'm not claiming. I'm not going around saying he owes me money, you know. I mean, I was proud that I was able to figure that shit out. Never, you know, always having used GPS myself, but for different reasons, like you said, that uh, we couldn't use refraction. The the, re the way I come up with thirty nine fifty nine is I uh, I I use trigonometry and put myself directly under Polaris, and then I I moved sixty nine miles. And uh, with a one degree change, and I got a height to Polaris of thirty nine fifty nine. So I really wasn't using the radius of the Earth. But uh, like I said, I'm, I'm not saying that you owe me because there were strict uh, rules. But I would ask, uh, you know, why can't we use the uh, the Gleason's map? You know, um, I I think we should be able to use that. The the way Globers complain about the Gleason's map, it does say as is, and um, and Gleason was a flat Earther, and um. I think there's a couple ways to do it on the Gleason's map, but um, I think when you take that away, you pretty much, I don't see how we could really do it, man. We got to draw our own map and then well, explain it. it. It makes it tough. I'll give, I'll say that it makes it tough. Brian, when I do, 
when I did, where do I have, I have my, uh, I have the book here somewhere, I thought. Oh, there it is, all right. When, when I do in this book, this, this process for celestial navigation, um, right here, here's, here's the book. This here, this does, this isn't using a map. You, this normal celestial navigation, how it's done commonly, there's no map involved, actually. This just outputs the latitude and longitude. So, you know, the Gleason map in the patent says it's an extortion from the globe. That's why you couldn't use it, because it's labeled as an extortion from the globe, right? If you use the Gleason map to do celestial navigation, you're admitting the Earth is a globe. Uh, but you, you don't have to use a map. This would work just fine. And when I did my $100... So I can do version, it in free space? What? I can do it. I can submit a. Uh, I can submit my uh, answer and use free space. And use free space. Yeah, no map. Just I can do it in free space. In other words, matching the celestial sphere. I don't need a map. Yeah, but I can do it. You, in, yeah, I mean, you you have to the 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 uh, rules say if you're going to use the actual celestial sphere, which I find a little weird. But you have to provide a mapping mechanism between the the celestial sphere and the coordinate system that you're going to be outputting in, right? And I, when I say mapping, oh, I'm not meaning land mass mapping. I mean just a, some, some you, how are how are you putting the celestial sphere, which is not flat, and doesn't map easily to a flatness? How are you mapping that to a to a flat? No, the celestial sphere is a full sphere. Because there are southern hemisphere maps or uh, stars, right? What do you mean? <laughs> there, half of the stars in the sky are in the southern hemisphere of the celestial sphere. Yeah. So, 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 so who who proved that? Ain't that what this debate's about? So you're you're just automatically assuming a hemisphere. You're the Is one that, that you're said cel you're the one that said celestial sphere. Yeah, celestial dome. I should have said. Okay, correct me. But oh, let me say one more thing. Okay, before dome. Move, before okay. We, wait, before we move on, let me say one more thing. Um, you you say you act like you're measuring sixty nine miles per degree, and you, you you speak of this a lot about these curve measurements. Uh, you, can you directly measure curve, or do you have to, like you described earlier, you have to go off a straight line to derive your curve? So all curvature. Or calculations are second order measurements. You're not every time you claim you're measuring curvature, yeah, second order calculations and whatnot. And uh basically you're you're uh would you agree with that? That you're I not have, measuring I, curvature. I have I have no problem with second order measurements. Very rarely right. does anybody ever do a first order measurement. It's extremely rare. So uh and and it's not even second. It's probably third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh order measurements is what you're actually doing if you're gonna be real specific about it. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. Right? You you can't you can't make a tape measure without doing some math to know where to put the second, third, fourth, fifth line. And and when you're gonna put a half inch, you have to do some math to know where to put that half inch mark. So hey, Brian, uh, you're up. yeah, anyway, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so number four. Yeah. Pressure okay, gradients. So yeah, so pressure gradient. Once again, I was uh I wanted a demonstration because uh I gave you a demonstration of uh of a uh, sun um setting and not shrinking in size uh, i give you a demonstration of a, another light disappearing right in front of your face i give you the refraction demonstration and i i also i don't know if you've seen it on my channel but uh i was able to demonstrate a pressure gradient inside of uh about 70 foot of pvc pipe by uh just heating up one side about the last 10 foot i put in a gutter and then the other 10 last 10 foot i put in ice water and i just uh left each end open-ended and I loosened up a balloon and capped off each end. Well, what happened is that I was able to demonstrate the on the hot side, it puffed the balloon up, demonstrating a gradient, and then I, I squeezed it to bounce the other side up to show that it's all continuous. And as soon as I let go, you see the, the uh, other side dance, and then it went limp, and then the hot side 
the pressure built right back up. So I was able to show a, a gradient. I was able to demonstrate a gradient in containment. So we ask you for pressure without containment or a vacuum or near vacuum without containment, and y'all claim gradient. Well, I've demonstrated a gradient, so now I'm going to ask for a gradient without containment. Uh, we want to see something, some kind of demonstration without containment. Okay. We're able to show you all of the others. All right. I got it right here. Here's, here's my phone running the barometer app. Pressure. 14.3091 PSI. Welcome to Platter. 14.30. You agree. 88 eight PSI. So I've shown you a pressure without containment, without a physical what do you mean? container. Right here. From here you just to here. We're contained. The pressure changed from here to here, and there's no physical container. So we're between. contained then, right? There's no physical container between here and here. I mean, you could you can see from here to here. There's no container. So I showed you pressure without no, a physical container. There's no, there's no container halfway. There's no separation halfway in between my pipe either. Yeah. But yeah. there's a gradient. Okay. My point is we're arguing whether we're walking around in a contained area or not. Okay. You're just going to use that area to declare no containment. I can, like I said, I can demonstrate a vacuum. In containment, I can demonstrate pressure in containment, and I can demonstrate the gradient you're speaking of that we have outside in containment. I can do it in 70 feet. Can you demonstrate any of them without just declaring? Yeah, I just, I mean, I can do it again. No I'll, containment. I'll, I'll do it again. Right, right here. Here we go. I'm going to welcome you to flat earth again. No container between here and here. No container. No physical well, container. Welcome to flat earth that, again. That, that, that didn't show flat earth. You... There's no explanation still, for this for flat earth. Yeah, what causes this pressure gradient? Temperature. I just showed one way to do but it. But it's the same in temperature. Containment. You haven't showed me no way. But it's the I same temperature. Brian, it's the same temperature right. here. It's the same temperature. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, so you just proved that we're contained. I proved You're that there's no necessary physical container for this brian i just explained how i can show a gradient inside containment okay and you're backing it up saying yeah you're right look look at my phone okay. i'm going up and so, down so, you're right. so let me let me let me see if i can let me, me see if i can draw out a logical uh statement from that um, i'm asking for a demonstration if, hold, hold on let, let me just let me just try this here if okay. if there is containment and there is a gradient, if P then Q. Gradient, therefore containment. Q, therefore P. So Did you, you said double Q? So, so you said if P, therefore Q, Q, therefore P. That's your that's your argument? No, did you just double double Q? You said if containment and if gradient. Did you just no. double if, Q? If containment, then gradient. Gradient, therefore containment. That's that's what you're saying, right? Well, pre pressure. I'm trying to advance I, the argument. Hold, hold, no, no, no. I want to make sure that I'm correctly stating your logical claim. Containment, therefore it, pressure. Containment, therefore vacuum. Containment, therefore delta x or gradient of said. Okay. Yes. Yeah, pressure so yeah, or vacuum. Yes. Yeah, so you are saying if p then q, q therefore p. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, you can put it like that. I'm good with that. All right. So you what know, we're trying you know to do is prove whether, whether we're walking Brian, around. Brian, in, Brian, what's that? Or not. What's that called? What? It's, uh, modus colon or something? No. Try again. Syllogism. Try, try again. Just go ahead. Tell me. School me. If it's P called... then Q, Q therefore P. Modus ponens. Modus ponens. That's right. That's what you just did. My point is, is I'm trying to figure out whether we're contained or not. That's the argument is whether the air, air around us is contained. And uh, I'm trying to advance the argument a little bit. So I'm asking for a demonstration 
Yeah. I was able to demonstrate Brian, uh, all Brian, the love in containment. Brian, so that's it. Modus ponens is called affirming the consequent. You just did an affirming the consequent logical fallacy. And you were fine with that. All right, I'll give you a point for that. I'll give you a point for the first one, which kind of was. So it's six, it's seven to two. Can't win them all, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> It's a good score system. Score system there. Score scoring system there. All right, who's up next? <laughs> uh, Brian, I think you're up. Okay, man. Um, I want to uh, in my gap, man. Can I play my? Uh, can I? Uh, this is to keep tune honest, man. So, okay. um, see if you if you can. Um, One of the videos you already sent me, or no? Let me see. Did I send the? I don't believe I did. Real quick. No, you only. See, sent if me you want to ask a. Uh, yeah, it's actually uh, Tune's turn. That was mine uh, with the pressure gradient. Oh, my bad. Tune, go ahead. Uh, all right. Well, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, uh, all right. This is this is an uh, uncut video of uh, of the sun in Antarctica for five days. So there you go. Um, uh, it's uh, it's a two minute video. I'll speed it up a little bit here. This is available on um, Vimeo. It's called "What Does the Sun Do at the Pole." So, five days uh, time lapse of the sun going around um, counterclockwise here. So. I don't. I don't know if you want to watch the whole thing or if you want to just uh, respond. Right, I'm, I'm checking that one out. I'm checking that one out. And okay. um, you say that's uh, you say that's five days. It's a five day time lapse of the sun going counterclockwise in Antarctica. And it's exactly maintaining damn near the same height. So that that must be right by. North Pole. Can can uh can you give me the dates on that so I can match it up with the uh with the government with the uh, dot gov cameras and uh I'd, uh I'd like to get a copy of that. I'd yeah, like, I can like I can just send you to to the, the the page on it's on Vimeo. It's called What Does the Sun Do at the Pole? And it's it's actually yeah. at the the pole and you can see this these buildings here. Um these these are different experiments that they have there. This is a telescope that's pointing um, straight up there. So, yeah, I'd like to. In fact, I'll even do this. I'll give you your third point in uh, seven three, and because uh, I'd like to scrutinize that. And um, you know, if if it makes it through uh, through through my you know test, then I'll you know. But I'd like to look into it and uh, compare it to. To the dot gov cameras and check the weather for that yes. day we can almost always find holes in, in, in these videos but you know i'm not gonna make assumptions yeah. to be clear this is not the north pole south pole right, right. yeah where's the, that's it amongst and scott uh yeah at the at the actual like real close to the actual south pole and so like this this particular telescope here you can you can place I've placed it before where, where it is and, you know, its name. And then this other one that's coming up mm -hmm. here, that one there, you can also look up. So there you go. I just don't see the, I don't see the South Pole Station. That's all. So yeah, I think it's wrong. off. Uh, if I'm, I don't, Alain, this might be who, it here. Who, see that? that okay, who, who is, uh, who, who, lays claim to this video uh the guy i forget his name it's on I think Vimeo. It's same, same guy who does all the videos yeah what's his name his name is uh Starts i forgot F, uh robert schwartz remember. oh there you go yeah robert schwartz oh my god i see that your schwartz right, yeah, I'll, is I'll as big as it. mine <laughs> <laughs> all right uh what do we have left yeah, here if you could put if you could play that that one I just sent, man, that's the uh, that's the uh, the okay. the five with the with the. the uh. Okay, now you can see. We're ready to watch this. Uh, no, just a second. 
Oh, dang. Oh, yeah, that's it. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right. There it goes. Is that the model predicts is itself an assumption. No, no, you didn't pay attention to what I said. None of oh. my presentation had any assumptions about the shape of the Earth. I assume nothing. Nothing at all. On a flat surface, every triangle measures 180 degrees. On, on a sphere, every triangle measures more than 180 degrees. It's an absolute necessity. So if he has to add it up to 180 exactly, Earth's flat. If they measure more than 180, Earth is not flat. All of these, more than 180 degrees. Um, if you look down the page, we see, for example, triangle two, triangle three, and triangle five um, add up to a little bit less than 180 degrees. And never, never do flat earthers ever take into account the details, right? They just say, well, it must have been from, from a certain level, but it's not. It's always wrong. Get your details right before you start talking about stuff. It seems like you were convinced by lack of detail and lack of critical thinking on how to actually analyze stuff. These, these triangles, these spherical triangles were measured. They were more than 180 degrees, every single one of them. That absolutely defeats the possibility that the, the surface of the earth could be flat. No question about it, because they're not 180 degrees. Every one of them is more than 180 degrees. But if we look down the page, we see, for example, triangle two, triangle three, and triangle five um, add up to a little bit less than 180 degrees. Please address the actual evidence. They're on mountain mountaintops or hilltops or on a tall structure that they built. There's nothing in the way. I, I don't know what to say. I don't say it seems like such okay. a theological. Maybe, maybe you should actually do some research on your own. Uh, These things have been done for centuries, right? You, you didn't know about it because your, your Papa Flirt didn't tell you about it. Okay. That's the topic. Go ahead. And so my question is, is uh, do you feel like you owe... Uh, Ryan, an apology, because uh, you boldly claimed about five times, I just clipped out a few of them, that, uh, that I, you know, that, um, that all the triangles measured aren't 180. So on a flat earth, with the way we describe it, we would expect, you know, some of the angles to be a little bit less and some of them to be real close to 180. And then probably around mountains and other regions, maybe more than 180, but always, you know, skirting right around 180. Um, that's what we would predict on a flat earth. So do you, do you concede now? Anything at all ever? No, I'm just saying, do you concede that that you were wrong? That all the all the triangles aren't more than 180? No, you, you didn't you didn't look at the correct number. We, we I mean, we went over this before, but uh, let's see here. I, I have I have the uh, the, the, the publication First order. here it is okay here it is I have I have an example up of one of the the ones that uh, that you might have been talking about I'll share my screen here there's there's a several first order measurements right, here we go that are under 180 here we go here we have triangle number two only middle base only west base Buffalo Mountain see that right so this is this is the uncorrected values here. They sum up to just a little bit less than 180. That's the uncorrected values, but they they it's an intermediate step. When when they're done, that triangle, the corrected values, that triangle comes up to 0 0.04 arc seconds. Why are you correct? Why? Because because the because they're being precise. They're working hard to be as accurate as possible. So, so they're when, retrofitting a model. No, they're I not. I mean, I'm asking you what what's the cause? What's the okay. cause? Right. Where the where are they retrofitting the model? Show where the the models being retrofitted in this book. Well, maybe I'm wrong. What if page? You can, no, you, you no, 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 no. You made that very specific claim. You have and maybe a, I'm wrong. Then why are you making I'm the claim? What are the? Well, I want to know what are they correcting for? All right, no, Brian, are you are you retracting your claim? No, I'm asking. Hold what on. are they correcting right, for? We're gonna we're gonna go right to your claim. You are claiming that they are retrofitting the model. You make a positive claim of specificity. I said, of the are they retrofitting? Are they retrofitting the model? You said that they okay. are retrofitting. What page are they retrofitting on? Okay, well, I change it to are they? Okay, or are, are they, they correcting? The, for the answer is no. They are not retrofitting. Okay, so what are they correcting for, please? All right, can you see these pages here? So on these pages here, they're going through the the uh, the correction. That's what all these pages are for. And I'll, I'll go up to. What? Well, you asked me to explain it. You're gonna have to let me explain it. No, I'm not asking for an explanation. I'm asking for uh, what is oh. the correction for? You, are uh, you asking for an explanation, or are you not asking for an explanation? You're gonna have to decide. Measurement. You you agree the first order measurements 
are less than 180. No. You, you, what, you what, just what do you said mean first order? When you say first order, what do you mean first order measurements? What, what do you mean by that? Direct measurement. Direct. Okay. What now? Now, what you're doing, Brian, is you're trying to apply my words to something other than what I was meaning when I was saying those words. So let me let me be very very specific, <laughs> Brian. When I said in that video that you you showed of me, when I said, be all very of, honest, please. Don't be specific. Be honest. Just let me talk. All right. When I was saying that. I was not I was specifically referring to the these on the the second column here the when they have done the corrections you see that that's what I'm talking about right here because this is this is the the most accurate triangle that's what they're doing and these pages and pages of things that they're doing here are to adjust for errors in their measurements and to get them out you see they're always talking probable error of a single observation they're talking about the the residuals here, the residual is how much it's it's uh, it's varying from the standard deviation, from the average, from the mean, from these different things. And they're making these these uh, equations here. They have a, a series of interrelated equations. They call them um, mingled. I forget the word they they use in T. W. Wright's book. And then they're they're solving for these series of equations here, a very manual way, right? It'd be very quick to do it in Python today, but uh, but back in the day, the computers that they had were humans. Humans were computers, and the humans had to do all this work here, and they're doing all these adjustments. And so you see here, this uh, correction to one point one six. You see that? We you go down and you find in one of the triangles where you, that they did that. You're going to find that 1.16 that they added in somewhere in one of these triangles, right? That they're not, and that they're not, none of these equations here are retrofitting a model. What they're doing is they're correcting for errors because these different triangles don't, when you measure them, they don't uh, overlap at exactly the same point from different angles. So they know that there's something imprecise about it, and so they're doing everything they can to correct for those imprecisions. Hey, Tune, you're up. They, they know they're begging the question, basically. No, or, they're or basically maybe, not begging the, the question. They're one hundred percent. They're one hundred percent trying to be as precise and accurate as possible, and they're using they're using these these e, this this correction mechanisms that have been around for, for before this particular survey was done, written about by T.W. Wright in his book that's open source. You can go grab and look at it and read it through yourself and see how these things that they're doing here is what T.W. Wright was talking about. What's hey, causing all the errors? We'll, find, we'll follow that right, up. We can, we can move on. We can move on. What's the guy's name real quick, Tune, on that book? Uh, T.W. Wright. I right, think it's like W R I G W R I yeah. And Thank you. Okay, go ahead. I, I could be it it might not be T W. Oh there it is. Yep. Process is so well understood as to need no further remarks. Reference may be made to T W Wright's Treatise on the Adjustment of the Observations, New York, eighteen eighty four. There you go. Thank you. You're up. And, all right. Your turn too. In in the book, in the book, where is it? Oh, uh, in the book Einstein wrote, I have it here somewhere. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, in 1916, he wrote a book, and I'm going to share my screen here. So, oh, you are sorry. Yeah, I mean, take um, he wrote a book, and in the book, he referenced two non-terrestrial measurements that uh, can that measure Earth's orbit around the sun. Um. And let me see. I'm, I'll pull up the, uh, the 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 page. So the one of them, you're not sharing right now. I don't think. Uh, you're correct. Um, yeah. I will in a second. People people are seeing seeing what I'm doing here on my side. So so one of them that he's talking about was aberration, and aberration. Don't don't get confused by aberration being um, what Aerie was also looking at. It's similar, but it's not the exact same thing. 
So it was by James Bradley. So, all right, I'll share. I'll share this so you can see it. All right, James Bradley wrote, uh, wrote this 1727. He published this. It's uh, is where he measured aberration. He was he was looking for parallax, but he found aberration. He was it was a complete surprise. So a um, little bit right there. Not a lot of diagrams in the these, uh, typesetting was a challenge, but it's a pretty cool thing to read. Um, he did find then that uh, there's the these two columns here. We have the difference of de uh, delineation declin sorry the difference of declination by observation, and the difference of declination by hypothesis, and uh, four and a half seconds, eleven and a half seconds to twelve seconds. So he was half a second off there, very very close. Seventeen and a half to eighteen and a half seconds, arc seconds. These are. Um, he did this by measuring the star. Um, Eltonin, which is the brightest star in the Draco constellation. And Eltonin is 75 degrees in the ecliptic plane. So if you're looking at the celestial sphere, it is rather high in the celestial sphere where he measured it in um, England. That is visible year round. So anyway, here is here is an example of uh, of what aberration sort of is. You see where the uh, are you seeing that? diagram I'm sending there mm -hmm. okay yeah so, yeah the person with the umbrella uh, standing there with the rain coming straight down and in order to not get wet while moving you have to tip the umbrella forward somebody that's not running with you still sees the rain coming down but if somebody is moving along with you you see the rain coming at an angle uh, all right next one here I would say I would Oh, I'm sorry. not hold on I'm not done so so what that does is is that sh that makes makes it so that uh stars depending on wh where they are in the celestial sphere will have a different behavior but where they are versus where they appear to be is slightly different because of that that diagram that I showed you a second ago here is uh what you see when looking when looking straight up so this is showing straight up to this the, the celestial sphere to a like basically a zero a 90 declination in the celestial sphere um they they trace a circle throughout the year and uh it's an ellipse everywhere else and then at the uh ecliptic equator they just draw a line so here is here is the actual entry in encyclopedia britannica for 1910 so there you see the the little e ellipse there at the top there and then it shows examples of a circle and then squishing down and then eventually a line so the top one would be at 90 in the ecliptic sphere and the the bottom one is at the equator of the ecliptic sphere so that is how uh one of the ways that we know that the earth is orbiting the sun because the aberration draws a uh, varying t um, squishinesses of ellipses throughout the year and again this is you can find this on my website mc2.net just search for orbit and then you can find the uh, earth's orbit around the sun page so all right there you go yeah i looked into this and the, the irony man is that everything i've looked into is uh he had predictions okay you say he's looking for parallax but they had the heliocentric predictions to um and they got unexpected results which is another way of saying they were wrong and they said they led to the first evidence that the earth position is is moving around the sun okay so by measuring the star the star's position was their first Direct evidence, they claim, that the Earth is what's moving, which, uh, ironically enough, with the with the Aries that he just showed the raindrops, um, it was in 1871. They, uh, you know, Aries made also a prediction, which he got unexpected or wrong results because they said they were trying to figure out whether the Earth were moving or the stars were moving. That was what was being debated back then. 
Some people might deny it, but that was the debate. And uh, he came up with a simple test that that if if the light it's let's call the light raindrops, okay, and if and we have a cloud above us. So if the raindrops are moving independent of the cloud and they're coming straight down, then uh, no matter what we do to slow that raindrop down, it's going to hit the bottom of the telescope. So by by filling the telescope up with water, Aries predicted he would have to tilt the telescope to uh, an additional certain amount to account for the fact that it's the Earth moving. So in other words, if the telescope's moving or the Earth is moving with the telescope sitting on it and the raindrop is coming down the tube of the telescope, it's not going to make it all the way down to the bottom. It's going to hit the side of the telescope. This is common sense. But what they did instead is uh, they got unexpected results, which uh, I don't see really. And, and so what they did is they... Uh, abolished the ether i guess they, they they said it was in respect to ether which still doesn't explain them not having to tilt the angle but then in mickelson morley um which was why are you changing the, the topic first, i'm almost done this is all tying it's together it's a whole different topic that, ironically enough ironically enough the, the next unexpected results proof of uh, of us moving okay and wind up being all these wind up being proof for special relativity is that they got unexpected results or wrong results, and they re-abolished the ether because pretty much every every prediction the globe makes, it, when it comes to direct observations of the Earth in motion, apply to measuring the stars moving and their unexpected results, which go on to somehow prove something else in the future. When they just re-explain it, and they they. I had more to say, but uh, I'll cut it short. Yeah, we're, uh, we're good on that topic. Do you have another one left, or did you just skip around? Yeah, I had a fun one. I had a fun one at the end. Um, Globe model at, buoyancy? At, at, yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, just the heliocentric model buoyancy in general. And I'm, I'm not trying to... Uh, so this, to me, was a fun one. Like, uh, well, hold on a second. I mean, I'm, of, hold on, I'm lost real quick. Didn't, didn't you go first two months second? Yeah, some something... Yeah. Somehow so we missed you that. have none left, right? Two, you have none left. Um. Oh yeah, I I did not do reciprocal zenith angle measurements. I skipped for some reason. I skipped my number four. Okay, so we got tune up to finish off. Because you've done your yeah, yeah. plungers, right, Brian? I had one no, left. He has one, one more. He has, oh, he has yeah. one. Okay, yeah, here's another one. Okay, hey, go ahead. Yeah. So um, so this is kind of a fun one. Like uh, I just wanted to get people thinking. Like when they, uh, I'm not trying to pin you down, but this is uh, food for thought. So when I when we mentioned Helios, uh, I could give two quick uh, explanations of, uh, to me, what would be head scratchers at the very least. So when we talk about the heliocentric model and the, the math of the buoyancy, I've asked several Globers if gravity increases, does buoyancy increase? And uh, Ruip and, um, you know, uh, Zanuck, others, they've all, you know, looked at it and agreed, yes, that since gravity is in the equation, yeah, if gravity increases, buoyancy increases. So got me thinking about the, um, it got me thinking about how they claim that it rains diamonds on Jupiter. And I, and at first I was always thinking, you know, to adjust the density, they have to come up with absurd claims. But then when I was just thinking about the buoyancy, I was thinking, well, if to precipitate down, we have to be as dense as diamonds, then if we tried to, I would ask this, if we try to go and put a probe onto Jupiter, it, wouldn't it just bounce off? In other words, if we couldn't get it at least as dense as diamonds, it would float up in the clouds. Is, am I right to say that? That anything we tried to land on Jupiter would just bounce off because it wouldn't be dense enough to make it to the surface? Uh there is not a, a strong agreement on whether or not there is an actual like solid surface to Jupiter. Some think it may just be liquid. Um, but yes, you you would need to to have uh, your whatever your probe is doing. It needs to be more dense than than where it's going to be, or it would have to somehow accelerate itself downward, which would be kind of difficult. So yeah, if if uh, Jupiter is just increasing, say, gaseous density. <laughs> um 
then whatever probe, if you didn't go in, you know, go in at extremely high rate, would eventually find some neutral buoyancy level within within the the planet, and then that's where it would rest. Uh, it, it it could potentially be beyond a liquid boundary too. I don't, you know. Fair enough. So and yeah. then this, it's in, to end off mine, to end off mine, I was thinking, I was also trying to apply that. I had a couple conversations where I was thinking about Lagrange points, and I was thinking about the Earth and the center of the Earth, and um, and I was thinking if we took in free space and we slit a sphere dead in half and just separated the the two half spheres, two flat sides of uh, and then you know two hemispheres basically, and we just had them like five foot apart. And I, and I was right in between both of them in free space. And I stuck my arms out. I stuck both arms out to, uh, to tickle one, the center of one half sphere and the, to tickle the other. I'd basically be in a Lagrange point. Um, if I'm, if I'm correct that, uh, the new centers of mass would be the center of each one of them halves or as close as you can get to the center. I would basically be pretty much weightless in, in a weightless area if I'm directly in between the two. So I would ask if I uh, enclosed them two around me, and I had like a five foot bubble around me, um, just by moving them together, would that crush me? Would I be getting crushed by weightless mass? By weightless? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's uh, just. Uh, right. I can. I thought, think right? I can explain some things there. Okay. Uh, if you had a hollowed out portion of the Earth right in the middle of the Earth. That's called a Dyson sphere, and inside that that Dyson sphere, you would be weightless. If you were to slice the Earth in half and move them some distance away from the other, now you have two separate Earths, and each of them would have a separate Earth. new center of mass, and each of them being quite large would, and if you say you move them far enough away from each other that they weren't close, then each of them would right away begin starting to collapse into a sphere again to the uh, you know working <laughs> working against the tensile strength of the materials that it's made out of yeah so i don't know why you're sticking not, uh, and why you're sticking your arms out and tickling them i don't know but you probably should not naughty boy <laughs> well crushed or not crushed though i, I didn't quite if, get it if, well these i don't know that Let's say you're not slicing them. Instead, you're just hollowing out a center, a point in the middle, like a, a chamber right. in the middle that's a hundred feet in diameter. You you would Fair be enough. you would be weightless inside there. So I wouldn't get crushed. Okay. So um, all right, all right. thank you for that. Now we know that's where that. faking, faking the ISS stuff is from the center of the earth. Yep, that definitely makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> okay, go, Brian. All right. This is this is my last one, right? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Too. All, right. Uh, all right. I'm sharing my screen. All right. Okay. Reciprocal zenith angles. Here is a diagram of the two cases that we're talking about. Um, on the left, we have... Uh, uh, so reciprocal zenith angles is where you take two theodolites, you point them at each other, or one theodolite and you point it at a target, and then you go to the... You swap where the theodolite and the target are and you measure it again. Um, on the left side, this is on the Earth. Those those two lines that are kind of diverging from each other on either side, those are the vertical. And so you're going to put a, a theodolite, and and the theodolite then you will level it so that it knows where you know where it, so it gets things vertical and horizontal correctly. And then you measure the angle down to the other one, and down down unless there are significantly different elevations. It's going to be down. If they're at the same elevation, they're they're going to be down on the globe. On the right side, we have what it would be like if the Earth were flat. You'd have this this blue line, and I don't know, the angle isn't. Um, the, the, don't get confused by the the up up angled lines there. You'd have a ninety on each side there. Uh, and so what you do then is you sum the two angles. If uh, the angles sum to one, re neglecting refraction, if the angles sum to 190, that would indicate that the Earth is flat. And if the angles sum to more than 180, that would indicate that the Earth is a globe. And then you'd want to take into account some refraction effects. Um, 
and and typically you do that afterwards because it's um uh, or you can measure the vertical temperature gradient like in that one paper i showed anyway so here uh baron rutledge who has a, a he's a surveyor he went to the salt flats in utah and he measured it here's his field notes um i put all of his notes into a spreadsheet you can look at that just go to my website search for baron you'll find it baron rutledge here's his video i'm not going to play the whole video but uh here's his get out of here there you go so you can see the process he did there's his theodolite he's showing how he did it anyway there's this diagram um so he he measured it he found it to be more than 180 degrees in all those instances here we have how much more 0 0.004 which is 15 arc seconds uh his measurements are accurate to better than let's see better than one second i believe yeah his his standard deviation is 0.4 his standard deviation is, of mean is 0.2 arc seconds so it's uh it's very likely extremely likely that he is precise enough there to con confidently say that 15.2 arc seconds is correct and then I'll, I'll give you one more thing um he's not the only one it's been done many times uh, for example, it was done in the transcontinental triangulation of the American Arc of the Parallel. We spoke about that just a little bit ago. Here is the chart of, uh, first, here's all the reciprocal zenith angle measurements. They were all typed in. Every single one of them in the book were typed in. Pages and pages of pairs of things that people, good people helped out, volunteered to type them in. And then it all breaks down to this chart right here. And each of these dots is the um, the horizontal scale here is the distance between the, the stations. The vertical angle is the more than 180 degrees than when they summed it up. And you can see this nice straight line going up there. And, and the topmost top right there is almost two and a half degrees of uh, reciprocal zenith angle overage over 180 and it's nearly 300 kilometers from mountaintop to mountaintop it's uh, 2.353 degrees um, this is on my website mc2.net slash se you can get to this exact no, uh, worksheet there are notebook it's all published everybody can see it you can look at all of the data here um, nothing is hidden or covered up. It's it's uh, a ton of work that these people help do typing in all the data. So we have um, Baron Rutledge on his own doing doing this, and we have um, uh, people doing it in a professional survey 120 years ago. Yeah, um, I would start by saying that um, when you're talking about the arc of the parallel at the 39th they uh their distance measurements which they were really just uh pulling um one side and their margin of error if you look up for pull and change was uh one to a hundred so for every hundred miles they were allowed a margin of error or of a, of a mile no they weren't um yeah, and then they improved no, right, that. Right, with, uh... right, right. Hold on. No, they did not have a one mile margin of error. They had a couple millimeter margin of error. I'm not talking about the angles, too. Chill out. I know. You're talking, talking about, about the, 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 the baseline measurements? Yes, I'm talking the, about the, 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 the margin of error for pulling chains, okay? Yeah, it's when they, not a mile. When they, move, when, they, when they move the tapes, it they improved it to one in a thousand, okay? No. When they, when they improved it... Dude, can I talk? You just know. You don't even know any of this shit. You just know. God, you're so dishonest, dude. Anyway, um, the the thing I would say is, uh, when you give the Great Salt Lake Salt Lake Lake example, I, I let let off this debate, showing you how Jesse Kozlowski and and uh, Tim Osmond. You know, I, I'll have to send you the uh the evidence for that, but you know, it's uh known to a lot. Where Strong's knob, where his crosshairs were underneath the Great Salt Lake, 
So whether if on a flat earth something's going on there or on a globe, you know, that's not supposed to happen. So we're not seeing in pure geometry, but I, I put together um so in other words, if we tried to apply Right, all you've done is avoid the topic. You've, to up. you've not touched the topic once that I brought up. If what, you what tried to, Go ahead, if, you tried to if, if you tried to measure reciprocal zenith angles to reality, like Skunk Bay, or you're going to get different shit all day long. I got a one minute video uh, that says reciprocal zenith angles, uh, Darren. It's about actually about 45, 55 seconds, man. If you can end it off with that. Okay, we'll end it with that and then uh, get ready to do your conclusion, your closing uh, reciprocal zenith angles. Okay, we're going to show this. And this will end it. Let me get this over here. Okay, here you go. Oops, that's not right. This one. Is that the video? Okay, here it goes. Yeah, it's just... This major divergence from Larry and Jesse does not include the effects of refraction. And we're always looking through the atmosphere, and we always have some refraction. And refraction always makes objects in the distance appear higher than they really are. Not by a lot, but by some amount. That's what the green dots are simulating. Larry, down there on the left at the red dot, was looking at Jesse. But he was seeing Jesse up there where the green dot is. He was seeing Jesse in a higher position than Jesse actually is. And that made Larry's angle A smaller than it really is in reality. The same thing. And that made Larry's angle A smaller than it really is in reality. The same thing was happening to Jesse. Jesse was looking down at Larry. He's now the green dot on the left side. And again, the effect of refraction is to decrease the angular measurement that Jesse's making. So there you see, look at his crosshairs. That's uh, Jesse's cross or uh, Larry's crosshairs looking back at Jesse. Look at the tripod. and it, I mean, just that little bit that it's cheated down and the fact they're assuming refraction, you know. That's why I wanted demonstrations of all the, these refraction measurements to make their shit work. Because as Toon showed you, he didn't want to concede, but he showed that the first order measurements showed angles less than 180 i know this is a different measurement but it still all goes hand in hand he can't claim refraction side to side with a horizontal measurement but he he'll just give me a bunch of numbers and say well they correct but he won't give me a cause you know and uh this is just another example where they're just retrofitting their model man uh you seen that in reality he's looking lower you know it's just you know, if prove you're going to claim, if you're going to claim retrofit, you need to show specifically where it's happening because you've made a claim, and as Austin says, positive claims have the burden of proof. You have the burden of proof. So if if the the, right. the model is being retrofit, show exactly where it's being retrofit. Okay, what I showed you earlier was the way you describe refraction working is you say that light bends toward the denser medium. Okay, so I showed you on a warehouse floor that ain't the case. I showed you in sugar water that you say we're supposed to see things higher, but that ain't what we've seen in the sugar water. We literally seen the, the uh, Toronto skyline lower than before he added the sugar water. So I, I can agree with you all day long that, hey, light's refracting downward toward the denser medium, but the resulting claims are just baseless assertions. You're demonstrating things appearing lower. And claiming that they're higher, it's baseless assertions. That's all you've gave. Uh, you've gave us nothing but baseless assertions all night. You haven't conceded one thing. You won't give me a cause for these corrections for the first order measurement. I gave you, know. you a cause. You didn't pay attention. You're dishonest with the first question, man. Hey, you, Brian, you, let me give you. You got your two minutes to do your outro. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm just, I'll, I'll keep it down to about a minute of, of bitching about tune. <laughs> yeah. But uh, well, this, no, is time to, like, this is your time to do it. So. I feel like. I feel like uh, we, we need to demand more demonstrations. All these baseless assertions, all these claims. I showed demonstrations. I, I've got videos of demonstrations with, with gradients inside containment. I've got demonstrations of dropping two size balls and one falling faster with the same air resistance. Uh, and I, I've got demonstrations of uh, light disappearing right in front of your face. And, and next week, MC Tune's going to say, how's the sunset? He's going to try and hold us to strict geometry. When the atmosphere is obviously lensing in either model, and they they want to hold us to strict geometry, but they want to use refraction to and and just use anything to correct some of their shit. They're now I guess they're claiming side to side refraction and the uh, cross country arc of the uh, parallel, the thirty ninth parallel. 
like he never gave us a cause for that. He he got pretty upset about it, but he still never gave us a cause. So what I ask is for demonstrations of of not what's happening. I want to see it happening in real life. The way flat earthers demonstrate and show you things, scale them, show us these orbits, show us refraction doing what you claim it does, show us these gradients, show us pressure without containment, show us anything at all, ever. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. All right. Tune, you got two minutes. All right. Well, multiple times I gave you the cause of the uh, the triangles being corrected. And, and you never heard it, so I'll say it again. The cause is that there is nothing perfect in meat space. The lines do not precisely meet at one exact point. And these, these, uh, these differences are called residuals. And so those, these equations and the formulas and the correction process by T.W. Wright is correcting for these in that process. So the first order triangles are the final number. The first number that you're reading there is not the first order. That is the intermediate step. That is not the final step. The final includes the corrections. So every one of those, no exceptions, every one of those in the final values with the corrections are more than 180 degrees. You did not one time talk about the reciprocal zenith angles that I that I brought up. You went right to a different topic. I brought up aberration as measured by James Bradley. You immediately deflected to talk about uh, Aries experiment, a complete, completely different thing. You didn't address the topic at all. You must have just seen aberration and thought, oh, that must be that must be this other one. Um, so I, I covered all of those things. I gave you exact exact demonstrations in the the the, uh, the write ups that were done. Doesn't have to be a video. Demonstrations aren't done in just videos, Brian. Big people can handle things that aren't just written in videos. They can actually have, have things that are written down because that's part of the scientific process, right? You do all of your experiments and then you share it to the scientific community. That's not generally done in video form. That's generally done by writing it up and then they have supplementary information. Sometimes videos, a lot of the time pictures and, and diagrams and uh, data, raw data sometimes. So anyway, Jared, thanks. It's been fun. Brian, thanks. I, 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 I like talking to you, man. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's been good. That seemed, that seemed so. honest. Uh, thanks, Tune. Thanks, Brian. Uh, yeah, thank you. There thank is you, one. Thank you, Jared. I thought I saw one super chat come through. Let me just check what that was, if it was for one of you. Uh, thank you, Slavery is a Choice, for becoming a member. And then we got The World is Rigged says, you guys have been doing these debates for a long time. Do you really think they're helping? That's a good question. Um, Toon, do you think any of the debates you've been doing are helping? Um, I think so. I, I yeah. uh, sometimes get people that message me and say, hey, um, I, uh, I, I used to be, I used to toy with Flat Earther. I used to be a Flat Earther, um, but, not, but no more. And uh, so I would say that's good. And uh, I, I, I have to figure that um, most people, if they somehow see this and then were toying with the idea and then decided, oh, that doesn't make sense. They're probably not going to contact me. Um, I, I, I think that it's so. So it's a little bit nebulous. How many? What? How effective? I don't know. I'm having fun. Uh, I'm entertaining myself. I'm educating myself. I hope that I'm educating other people and, and that we could then call this edutainment. Um, so. Yeah, I've learned a lot, uh, through the debates, man. I've learned a lot from tune, uh, a lot from even blue marble science. I showed some of his, you know, I think these debates are the closest we're going to get to any kind of truth because people can hear, uh, unadulterated, unedited version uh, no straw man, you know, we're each give state in our case. And, uh, you know, and hopefully this is how we uh, narrow the argument down at the very least. And yeah, for me, the reason along, I like to, these, forward. Yeah, for, to, to do these debates is because otherwise, if you get into an echo chamber, you're certainly not learning anything. You're certainly not growing. So it is good to hear uh, from people's beliefs. Give me your honest beliefs. Give me your claim. Let me hear it. And then it's up to the person watching to decide. Uh, what what better matches their reality or their worldview. So that's why I think it is beneficial to even me to listen to both guys uh, give their sides and then 
also it gives me a lot to talk about like this coming week. So for me, I'm, I'm liking it. There's uh, uh, lots of things I have down that tune talked about that I need to look into and then uh, report back. So I, for me, it's all good. We are going to work on the time thing. I'll figure out, I'm going to go back to the drawing board a little bit and think about uh, ways to keep the time shorter. Some of these topics, you know, they got on and they spent, you know, four minutes on the, just laying it out there. And then it's difficult to have a conversation in 44 seconds. So anyway, uh, it'll get better. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, Curtis, Flatter. Thank you very much for that super chat. And I believe that's it. Yeah. It's been fun guys. We will be back, uh, Thursday, I believe for speaker's corner and any final words from you guys. Yeah. Thank you again, Jaron. Thank you again, Michael. Always a pleasure, man. Uh, I got a few things to look into. You gave me, you know, I hope, uh, I hope I gave you some, you know, some food for thought, a couple things to look into. Maybe we can, like I said, consolidate our arguments, police our own and keep this going. And, uh, and maybe, you know, at the very least, uh, um, you know, shrink the arguments down to, uh, to the direct, direct meat of it, you know, thanks again. Right. Final words for you. Uh, I, I mean, I kind of, I kind of already did. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, it's been good. And, uh, I look forward to doing it again. So five, five G I, I keep looking for, Oh, well, not. that's your, you want to do five G. Yes. Somebody come and challenge me to five G cause five G is safer. Tune there thinks you know. 5G is healthy for you. So if you're somebody who disagrees. Safer. safer. Oh, safer. safer. Safer for you. Then what? Then, then 4G? 4G or 3G. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so if somebody wants to debate that, uh, you can do so right here on Debatism. All right, guys. It's been fun. I am trying to get my outro to play, but it's not working here. Mm. All right. I'll, uh, I'll say bye yeah. and uh, dismiss. Peace out. Later, guys. See you. All right. And I don't know. Right, I did close it out there. Um, what'd you think? Write in the comments of this video um, after it's done, or in the chat here, what you thought of of that format. I have I have my thoughts. I will I will give to uh, to Jaron, and uh, well, I got a few things to read here. Um, yeah, uh, obviously, PhD Tony. Uh, I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna get an opportunity to to uh, to press Jaron on your your uh, topic there so um, I don't know I don't know how we can what we could do to to press him on that right because he yeah he he makes some pretty bold claims that are a bit a uh, bit rough so all right Sparky NJ says Temple of Tune I'll have to catch the replay make sure you ask Brian for empirical evidence. Um, Oh yeah. He put the he put the sun on the ground. <laughs> That's all the sun sets. It's on the ground. That's it. <laughs> Brian oh and Brian couldn't. Have, I asked him, yeah, I asked him for the formula for bottom up obstruction. He gave me the globe formula. All right. Welcome to the globe. <laughs> yes. Um K Doc is a member. It says happy. Or it says hey, and then and then an emoji that looks like this, an emoticon actually. Uh, Giel Carlos says Brian blink twice if you're being held hostage. Uh, Pat the chat says Brian say something dumb if the Earth is a globe. Well, mission accomplished there. String Serena's one says Brian's blinking Morse code. It's a globe. Uh um mandevil says have jaron come to talk to tony directly he won't of course and that will show his true colors that could be fiery i'll ask him i'll ask him i <laughs> darren and Krakatoni. i don't know ah oh, man uh janish takas says blink once if you're learning against your will I've said that about flat earthers. I, I make them learn against their will. Two A H D cat diecast says I ordered that T-shirt I designed of you. I'll send you a link in email soon. Oh, so two <laughs> A H D cat that does not roll off the tongue, you know. He he took a um, 
He took a screenshot of me counting in binary, which is one, two, four, eight. I just did eight, the number eight. And he took a screenshot of that and made a t-shirt of it. I said, that's a perfect thing to wear to a family reunion or a funeral. <laughs> Let's see. Tony says, uh, PG Tony, this all started because he wanted to talk to me because I said various things when in fact I said the exact opposite. That's what has me frustrated. I uh, get it. That that happens. Brian tried to slip that in a couple times, like the so you concede kind of thing that Flatzoid and Witsit like to do. Brian, Brian isn't quite that that smooth to to just kind of lay it in there. He's he's like, so you're saying, and then something that I didn't. NANA says interesting uh, for six dollars and sixty six cents. Eddie Reese says for five dollars, even though he's a flirt, Jaren is actually a fair moderator. Interesting. He did, yeah, he did try. Uh, try to moderate fairly. And and so a little bit of uh, my feedback will be like, you need to set, I think you need to set a time to present a time for the other person to respond and then the discussion instead of just like this, it was five minute topic go. That was all the instruction that we had. So it was a little rough. And yeah, and Brian's, seriously, Brian's list one at most refraction demonstrations that's it so i read that i'm like oh so he's going to show some demonstrations because sorry i prepared every one of mine i have links and things that i'm going to show um and 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 he didn't right he didn't have anything he wanted me to show it <laughs> Dude, I didn't, you want me to prepare for your topic. You'd have to say it. Um, Caucasian sensation says, Brian, 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 you're an idiot. Accept it. Yep. Serena News 1 says a new format. Interesting. Poor guy. Poor Jaron. He's never going to live that down. The Sun Express says North is right here. Everything beyond that is East. It's the opposite of dearth. Pat in the chat says, wow, Brian said something dumb. Earth is a globe. Um, did I mention last week that Pat in the chat and I met? He was he was in the neighborhood. He stopped by. We we went out. We said hi. We forgot to get a picture of ourselves. Next time. Fairy Muff says, end flurf poverty. They need wide screens so they can see the curve. Mikey demonstrated gravity this week and will soon get glue for... We'll get, we'll soon glue four slinkies together. Oh my gosh. Oh, is he really going to do that? Mikey Smith is so funny. Oh my gosh. Oh, that reminds me. Go to Mark Sargent's video. Go Mar mention, right? Now just, just pull it up in another tab or something and go, go to Mark Sargent's page and say, Hey, did you quit flat earth yet? Um, PT Tony says before G was measured, G was obviously unknown, but GM was known for the objects in the solar system. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So you have this, this combined G times M that, you know, but you did, you can't split them yet. Uh, Amadeus Arkham says late and ready for some brain leaking flat math. We, he did not send me yet. I'm, I hope he will, his trigonometry. But, but oh, that was what he was trying to get me to concede. He's like, do you concede that the, the sun is higher than the cloud? Because its angle is positive. I said, no, the angle is not positive. That angle there from your feet to the angle the sun's coming in is negative, not positive. And he just, he couldn't get it. He wouldn't let it go. Um... There is there is a poll. If you've not yet voted in the poll, 465 of you have, and there's 515 of you right here. So we could we could bring it up to at least 515. So go vote in that poll. Um, the copper in quarter asks, do I play chess? I do not. I do not play chess. I, I play tic-tac-toe. 
it, I never really, I thought, hey, I, I'm going to like chess. And then I like add ah, it. I just didn't care. So anyway, thank you, Amadeus Arkham. <coughs> Axis and hello to Penny as well, uh, Axis. I see Spin says his captors have muted him. Yeah, Brian, he, Brian, he got, he was off. He couldn't hear us. Peter Miss Primes said, could someone please convert eight inches per mile squared into metric for me? There is a formula for it. Um, a num I don't, I don't know what it is. Ooh. And now we've got Ramen Ortiz, Mr. Noodles himself. Ramen, thank you for this. Um, or Raymond who several weeks ago said that he he wanted to debate me and still has not stepped up to debate me. So, Ramen, you're going to have to, you know, dig deep. Dig deep into those panties and see if you can find yourself some spherical objects down there. <coughs> no, I'm, I got, I got a, a coffin. Hold on. There we go. All right. Um... All right, uh, Fairy Muff says about Brian, uh, Mikey Smith says, yeah, he's going to glue four together, four sleekies, and claims the sun must be set in the ocean on a globe. Oh, my goodness. All right, anyway, Raman or Raymond says, why don't they know what gravity is itself in any fundamental way? And then he claims gravity is fake or intangible. It is, it is intangible, I'll give you that. Um... But why, so I, I will also ask then, Raman, why do they not understand all there is about quantum uh, electrodynamics? Is it fake? Is the computer you're using to watch this fake, even though they've used quantum electrodynamics to make it? Right, um, SD memory could not, or sta um, solid state memory could not work if it wasn't for quantum tunneling. Solid state uh, circuits completely at all wouldn't work. Semiconductors wouldn't work without it. Um, lasers would not work without, don't work without quantum effects. But we don't understand them at the deepest level. Um, in fact, there isn't even a whole lot of research trying to figure out Oh, these things work at the deepest level. <coughs> Does that mean that they're fake? Well, no. You do not need to understand all there is to understand about how things work in order to understand that things do work. Right? Uh, if you do not understand how an internal combustion engine works, you can still drive a car. You don't have to have the deep understanding of it. And and that is the frontiers of science. There is always something we don't understand. Um, when when the Bohr model of the atom, B-O-H-R, Bohr, it's after, named after a person, came out. And, and that's the one we're most familiar with. It's this nucleus with the electrons around it. You know, two in the inner shell, up to eight in the outer shell, or the next shell, right? That's not actually how it works but for a while that was our best understanding of it um and then more advanced ideas and understandings of it came to be and they're not it's not an electron in a specific location which which is newtonian you know physics it's that electron is somewhere up in this vicinity, most likely, and less likely in this vicinity, and even less likely in this um, vicinity. And we can't know its specific location and its specific momentum simultaneously. How does that work? We don't know. But it works. And we can use the fact that it works and the specifics about how it works to build the computer you're using right now. And it's not fake, just because we don't understand why. So, all parts of science has a question that we haven't answered yet. That's the whole point. Um, so, the fact is that mass attracts mass. It's simply a fact. The fact is that glass refracts light. 
why is not necessary to understand. Snellis did not know why this happened when he put together his law, neither did Descartes. So, and it wasn't for a while that, that had, people even had an idea, and those ideas were wrong. We've got better ideas for how light actually refracts. Um, and and for a long time, many people were wrong, and I, I, I suspect that almost everybody, as, you know, 8 billion people in the world, almost all of them get it wrong. Some of them get it righter than others. Why light refracts. But it, you don't need to. In order for, to, to build this lens, you don't need to know why. So there you go, Raman. Raymond. Kiros says, Raman Ortiz, you're here. When are you emailing MC Tune to get on his show live? We've been waiting for you. My email address is mctune at mctune.net. Let me check right now to see if just in case I missed it. <coughs> um, nope. Nothing. Nothing from you, Raman. Raymond. Oh, whatever. All right, Dale Frost. Electronics are made and used using the valence electron model, not the quantum mechanical model. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the way that we do things and plan things and engineer things are are not necessarily based on the, the deep understanding of it. They don't have to be. Um, so yeah, semiconductors are, are made using the valence electron model. Yeah, they take silicon, you dope it with a compound with one silicon has four in its outer shell with one more or one less electron in the outer shell. And so you have a, 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 a depletion of electrons or an excess of electrons in, in this, this area, in this, right. Um, but uh, quantum tunneling is a bit different when they do things like um, creating, I think we're creating gates um, and um storing data in uh, flash drives or a solid state media they're 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 pressing electro they're they're it's a rough way of saying like, they're like kind of shoving electrons out to this island they're stranding them in this island um so it, it's it's a simplistic way of, of explaining it yep <laughs> uh and you don't have to have a deep understanding of how it works in order to know that it does work and it could be wrong and it still works Anyway, <laughs> Raman says Le Leaky is victorious. I love the satire. Very good satire. Um, Repo Sandman says this is like Kramer at the dojo. <laughs> oh my gosh. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you're going to have to look it up. If you don't know what, what Repo Sandman is talking about. <sighs> Patrick Butler for $2 says glad to see you all again. Good to see you, Patrick. Larry Scott says show the graph of all triangle excess uh and he's so he's talking about i could pull it up larry and i were talking last night larry, larry uh, uh about this exact thing because we knew that uh because i knew the questions so let me let me get this let me get this and then we'll see here all right this is the spherical excess spreadsheet. Uh, th these are the these are the triangles. These are sorry. These are not the triangles. These are the reciprocal zenith angles. Um, I don't see. I don't know if there's a chart uh, of because somebody else did did this too. Other than me and uh, the the group of people, um, like. Uh, uh, Janish was one of them. I forget all of the people that helped. There's a lot of people that helped. And uh, I appreciate so much what, what you did. And it totally went over Brian's hat, didn't it? All the typing in. Uh, all right, these are the wrong ones. Um, this, oh, this took me forever. Is this the one? Yeah. So... These are the triangles here, and this is this goes right to the point, and Brian wouldn't have got it, but this goes right to the point of how they actually did the calculations in that error adjustment. Um, where is it? Uh, 
I'm looking. I'm looking here. That's not, I don't. I forgot. I forgot which one it is. But what I did is I took because there's all these these. Um, oh, there's a Google Earth link in the triangle sheet to show the triangles on the globe. There are okay. This one in the triangle sheet. Here's the triangle sheet. There it is. Yeah. All right, let's see it here. Yeah, and Janusz did a ton of work putting them on. All right, it's loading them up. There it is. There's the whole network um, of triangles. And and Brian Brian's like, they had a mile of error. No, they didn't, you dummy. They did not have a mile margin of error. They had, I was thinking, did he mean, did he read M, M for millimeter? And think it was mile. Anyway, here's the original. These original triangles were were small comparatively, but you can see here right across across the bay here, and and this one there's some sort of a buoy in the in the bay. Oh yeah, there it is, Brandywine Shoal Lighthouse. So all this work, they actually built every one of these points. They they built a a station. A lot of them had a tower. So that they could they could see over the curve of the Earth and over topography to the other uh, these other places, and one of them is labeled Insane Asylum. It's my favorite one. I don't remember where it is. I think it's somewhere in this vicinity here. And and as far as I know, the Insane Asylum is still there. If anybody's ever really out for a, a geocaching kind of thing go f go f try to find one of these original uh, markers because they give descriptions of them all in the the book the transcontinental triangulation but they get to the mountains here and look what they had to do because they're so far they're so the topography doesn't allow it to be these small triangles you have to do big triangles go mountaintop to mountaintop um, and then if you really want a fun thing, go look at Yolo base, which is over in California here. They, they did, they measured the baseline. So every once in a while, they measure a physical end to end baseline using early days. They used a chain. And then later on, they use these three meter long bars, solid bars of metal that were made of, of a material that did not tend to expand and contract much in the temperature. They had thermometers on them. They put them uh, underneath a tent uh, that was on wheels so that it wouldn't get hot in the sun. Um, and so there's there's actually some good documentation for the YOLO base. And when I see YOLO, I can only think of Jon Snow's eyelids. He has that he has YOLO tattooed on his eyelids. Um, all right, so you think it's in St. Louis is the, the asylum? Uh, oh, where'd it go? Past it. There's Wichita. There's Kansas City. Indianapolis. Where am I? Where's St. Louis? It's in Missouri. All right, right, right in here. There it is. Insane Asylum. Ooh. All right. There it is. There it is. So they put this marker on top of the building. So what is this here? Can we, can we like zoom in to this actual location here? Like, come on, look, give me, give me street view. There it is. Okay. All right. That, oh, that's great. I wonder if they like did it on the roof or something. There it is. <laughs> and look at all these lines coming to it. They all these triangles that they measured. To these people weren't slacking around, right? They they put tape over top of all these cars. I'm kidding. That's not what they did. That's just how it's laying it out. There, very cool. Thank you, thank you, uh, Janusz. Um. Let me get north, north back north. 
So yeah, and and I don't know. I I told Larry this last night, and I've told a few other people. I when I'm on vacation, I go find geodetic survey markers. That's that's my and my my family's like, what are you doing? Um, I'll show you. I found here's here's two harbors, Minnesota. We were up here in this bay right here, and on on this. So there's there's this lighthouse. Here's a port. These docks where they bring ore in from train tracks. And on this 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 uh, lighthouse here, and along this path, there are some geodetic survey markers, like right right in along in here. There's a couple. There's uh, at this at the elbow here. There's one, and way out at the end, there's another survey ter, survey marker at the lighthouse. So, and I got pictures of of those. And then I got survey markers. What am I doing, people? This is craziness. I don't know. Here's Pensacola. Uh, it's Fort Pickens. I'm looking for. Hold on. There it is. Fort Pickens right here. So here's Fort Pickens. And I got a geodetic survey marker picture right at this corner here. Right on this right here. From 1942. They surveyed it. So that's during during World War II. They surveyed this because they were using Fort Pickens during World War II. And this Fort Pickens, look at this, Fort Pickens was held during the Civil War by the North the whole time. The whole time. This was held by the North, and they were able to prevent the South from getting in uh, boats and, sh and stuff into the bay here, into the port. Can you imagine how important that was, that they couldn't get supplies in there during the war? All right. Uh, Janish says the station was probably on the top of the dome. The markers are off because they use the Clark spheroid coordinates. Yes. And so that was one thing that Janish found out was that, um, the, the coordinates that they used in the, the, the survey are different, slightly different coordinates than you would find in GPS because the GPS is using WGS 84. And so it's very slightly different. So there's a trans translation you have to do between them um ooh, all right i'll bring this up this is from stringer news one posted this uh this is the asylum the actual asylum there it is st louis insane asylum so if you remember just a second ago that's what we were looking at right there that's crazy. They just they just did you know, super creative name for that that survey marker point in Zane Asylum. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean there's there might be enough room in the asylum to house all the flurfers. Every one of them could go there. Okay. So, so, sorry, let me let me get back on where am I? All right. Larry said show the graph of all triangle excess. So I don't I don't think I I have done the spherical excess in there. Somebody else has done has typed in the numbers as well, um, and did their own spherical excess chart, and that might be what you're thinking of. I've I just have in this one the um, reciprocal zenith angles. But Janish, if if I'm wrong, let me know, um, or somebody else that worked on it. Um, anyway. PT Tony says the angular measurements in the survey are corrected from line of sight observations between sites to angles along the orthogonal to the zenith. Uh, along the orthogonal to the zenith. So, all right, I don't know if I quite understand that because these are those were horizontal angle measurements. They're azimuth angle, angle measurements, so they're not. I don't know if I quite understand. Hmm. Maybe you can maybe you can type something to me. <laughs> uh, R Raman Ortiz is uh, you know one thing about Nathan Oakley is that is that he likes to talk about his sexual fantasies live. <coughs> I don't know why he thinks that that that's an appropriate place to do it. Um, but you know he he's he's been known to say things like this. And why he'd want to, uh, oh, hold on. That didn't, that didn't come through. Anyway, 
Nathan says this. Now I'd like to know how my balls taste. That's it. Why he needs to say that live, I don't know. But Raman has a similar thing, says that Nathan Oakley spanked me. Well, we've never been in the same room. He could not have done that. Um, I don't think I would let him. I would probably put him on the floor. But uh, anyway, um, thanks for, you know, airing your your um, fantasies, I guess. Uh, Patrick Butler says, has Flat Earth destroyed your relationships, Brian? That's a good question. And, and uh, a lot of them don't want to answer that. But I think I think you find, I found, that uh, the majority of Flat Earthers have, uh, Flat Earth has destroyed their relationships. Their family and their friends are no longer the same after. Uh, okay. Triangle spherical axis is in the TJ Sandbox sheet. All right, let me look that up. TJ Sandbox. Oh, there it is. All right. Excellent. There it is. <clears throat> so there is the, and, and let's see, I don't know quite, quite what this is. We got the, the uh, triangle perimeter is the, is the bottom axis there. And spherical axis is the top axis there so you see on the left side the, uh, those triangles that were small that were near uh in you know on the east side they're the older triangles the older measurements from the you know 1850s or so and then as you go farther along you see more and more uh, bigger triangles as they get mountaintop to mountaintop and there you go you see the excess doesn't go below zero unless you lie and take the intermediate number. Um, so, um, and, and that, that's the, Brian said, and he, and it probably would be good to clip this. Brian says that, uh, that they, they must, they, they must be a little more in some places and a little less in other places. And, but they'll average out to zero. Well, they don't average out to zero. Even if you, even if you take the uncorrected values, it doesn't help you, Brian, <clears throat> because because there's just a couple of them that uncorrected work in your favor. The rest of them don't. And, and if you average them, it really doesn't because this one here, top right of that of that graph, the spherical excess is nearly 125. But what's that? Is that 125 arc seconds? probably arc seconds there you go very cool <clears throat> thank you Yanish. uh oh my gosh <laughs> this shirt this this is all right i'll just show it quickly this is this is the shirt that uh, hd uh 2 hd cat was talking about that one that's it that's all you get That's all you get. It's in there if you really want to look at it. <laughs> um, Eric Burns says, I think Raman Ortiz gets the pin of shame tonight. Yeah, I'm hoping. Hey, Raman, make sure you put a comment. And I'll pin it for you. Fairy Muffs says, can, can Brian tell us why we use feet above sea level and not the distance below the dome? Would this not be safer for aircraft? That's a great idea. Yeah, because, I mean, how do you know? You need to know how high up the dome is, Brian. They never have answers. How high is the dome? Don't know. How high is the sun? Don't know. How high is the moon? Don't know. What keeps up the sun? Don't know. What's the sun made of? Don't know. What's the moon <laughs> made of? Plasma. Oh my gosh. The sun's made of plasma. <laughs> it's just the opposite. This opposite world. What's the sun made of? Don't know. What's the moon made of? Plasma. No, it can't be. It's the same freaking features for centuries. <laughs> Plasma doesn't... Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. Borg Emporia says, I... Hold on. I better read this. Okay. Um, I, MC Toon, make Borg Emporia's turtle, Snappy, the high priest of the Temple of Toon. And I do dub the with my trigonometric slide rule. 
because he is an adorable turtle and deserves some chicken to eat. Make it so. Uh, Patrick Butler says, in his chair and moderating, hasn't he scammed enough people? Um, he is moderating. And there are more flat earthers that are that are uh, waiting to be scammed by him. Um, I think Oakley is the more of a scammer. How about that? I see Spence says Brian's logic. Can you explain the sun setting on one side and rising on the other? Also, how come equatorial mounds only use one plane? I've seen I've, this last week. I watched a video of a flat earther explaining how equatorial mounds work. You know how he said they work? He said they work because they work. That's it. He just said they work. <laughs> I did like, oh, that was good. Um, the whole, when, when flat earthers say, when they say pressure needs a container, when they say that, it's in affirming the consequent. And, and so when Brian is like, well, oh, I showed pressure differential in a container. And I showed in a container and I showed in a container and I showed in a container. I'm like, oh, so what you're saying that if P then Q, Q therefore P. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm good with that. I'll go, I'll go with that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> because that's Oakley's thing. That's Oakley. Oakley and, and it came up with that pressure container nonsense. Right. And, and it is perfectly an example of the affirming the consequent fallacy the modus ponens if you will it's they're claiming it's proof and and oakley applies that to his idea of science right you if you listen to him he'll he'll talk about an experiment he says proves things right he's saying the hypothesis you vary the one thing, and then he says you, it proves. Well, but when you put that together, it's F, if P then Q, Q therefore P. That's the structure that he's he's saying. So I got to use it on Brian. I, I was I've been I've been sitting on that for a while. I maybe I'll get to use it on another Oakley fanatics at some point. <clears throat> um. Demonic Leprechaun, I really want to know how we are supposed to show pressure without a container if they assume everything is in a container. Yes. I mean, I showed the pressure differential with my phone from here to here. And he's and his answer is welcome to flat earth. How? Because I showed the thing that we say happens. There is a pressure differential and there is no physical container. Right from here to 100 kilometers that way. There is no container. Well, I mean, there's the, my house, right? But you go outside, go over there, and then go outside, and there's no physical container. Yet the pressure drops to, to you know, a, 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 minor, a minor, minor portion of what it is here. How? You can't explain it. <clears throat> uh, can they show you a container not in a container? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, say Steve 6464 says, how is it that Jaren is still a flirt? Um, I don't know. I, part of it is, uh, and I don't envy anybody that's in this position. He can't without affecting his rice bowl, rice bowl being his, his income, right? If he were to change, he would have to move along and so uh, this is a good time to end the poll that i have uh because the poll is which who, who wins uh ranty seek truth speak truth jose jg gonzalez or sean g these are four former flat earthers <coughs> um and ranty won with 59 percent. so ranty of those ranty was the one that had income due to flat earth before he left. I, the others had some, but it wasn't a significant portion. Um, and, and Ranty, when he left flat earth, he had already disconnected his income from it. He gave away his channel and he wasn't making money on it. So he didn't have the rice bowl to worry about. He had already done that. He thought when he left, he'd give reasons for it and that people would come with him. And he was wrong. They attacked him. Um, they were not his friends. 
they attacked him. So, um, and, and, you know, Jaren, Jaren is not blind to that. And even if he, he may consciously say that he doesn't think that will happen, or he's not worried about that, or he can do without not having that income is scary. So I, I don't envy that. And, and Craig, FTFE is in the same position, right? This is what he does. This is his primary income. He doesn't, uh, he, <clears throat> if he switches, he wouldn't, right? Because the earth is a globe. But um, it, it, it would affect it because his audience would flip overnight. Now, here's, here's the thing. To, to question myself, to question Craig, to question those of us that are here. If we were, would the income from be, be replaced then by flipping? I, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. Some have said, well, you'd be the bet. No, I would not. I would, uh, I couldn't, I would never. So, um, mm -mm. do, 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 okay. Um, uh, Aaron Reese says they were all jerks to Ranty while he was with Flat Earth anyway. It's true. He wasn't, he wasn't fundamentalist flurf enough for them. That's true. They were pretty rude to him, but he got some support. You know, he, he, he did get, he, he, I mean, he had a monetized channel. He made some money off of it. So, um, uh, anyway, let me, let me move on. Um, one, one there. Uh, Nerd Alert says, petition to rename the Gish Gallop to Leaky Gallop. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, Parabindu. Ooh, I like that name. It sounds like it's from India. Parabindu. Says, completely off topic, has this been asked for? Is Brian the punk with boombox on the bus in Star Trek for Voyage for <laughs> and later in Picard Season 2? All right, hold on a second. Punk... With boombox. Um, Star Trek Four. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness, that that's it could be, it could be. All right, let's. I gotta get it. Uh, come on, load it up. Oh, so many. And you know, somebody mentioned earlier, and you're right, I have not configured us. I have not configured my um, U, U block origin to work in my um, incognito window. So I, I probably should. <clears throat> so there it is. All right. There's this one. I'll pull up this one too. <laughs> is, is this... Is this Brian Leakey right here? Punk with Boombox from Star Trek 4. Um, or, there it is. <laughs> is that Brian Leakey? I think, I, you know, I think you could have that. That'd work. That'd work. There's Brian Leakey. Thank you for that. Um, Parabindu, thank you for that. Uh, PG Tony says, "When and when is Jaren apologizing for lying about me?" Zip, Tony, would you would you want to talk to him face to face about that? I don't know if he'd accept, but uh, that would be that would be uh, interesting to have. Uh, Serena is one question for Brian. You made reference to one or more models several times, but never named them. What are they specifically? What is your flat Earth model? They don't have a model. Um, Austin Witsit has said that. Do I have it? I, uh, I, do I have it? Hold on. Yeah, here it is. We don't have a model. Yep. They don't have a model. But Austin will often talk about the model that they have. I don't know. I'm a stupid flat ortho, right? And I'm just a loser. I can't argue with that one, Austin. Uh, Kiros is, uh, um, Brian wants Flurfs to ask for more demonstration. Well, I'd like Flurfs to present a single flat earth map. Wait, we do have demonstrations. No. 
Yeah. <laughs> he wants to use the Gleason map in uh, in uh, Celestial Navigation. Like, Brian, it says right on it, even though he was a flat earther, Gleason was a flat earther, he did not describe it as a, a map of flat earth. He described it as a map from the globe. Uh, Indie size. Indie Tiger Sci-Fi Review says the Earth could be flat. It just needs to spring a leaky. Um, Sarah Jones says, I like the way Jaron agreed with you on the curve picture, but didn't want to stay on that subject. Yeah, Brian. I mean, it's it's I'm I'm mean, you'd think I'd be used to it and expecting it. Brian didn't want to talk about the topic. I'm like here's the actual prediction of the globe here's the photograph of the left right curve and he's like the dip 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 two degrees dip two degrees dip two degrees look i gave you the model if you think the model's wrong you point out the error in the model go go to go to bislin's page and say oh no that's that's not what a sphere would look like according to the sphere it should be something else so, all right, PG Tony says he would. I will, I'll ask him. I'll ask him. I won't hold my breath, but I'll ask him. Uh, Keith Cooney says, why were these guys talking at the end like we're going to the bottom of, going to get to the bottom of this globe flat debate someday? We have, <laughs> we have, in a long time ago. Yes, but in their mind, in their mind, they are approaching the Overton window. The Overton window is when enough people have have accepted their belief that then it just cascades and snowballs and everybody else does. <clears throat> Who said that? Witsit said that. Witsit thinks that they are approaching the Overton window. <laughs> and they think they're going to get to the bottom. They're going to get there. Okay. Tell you what. Give us a map. That's it. Just, just do that. Just step one. Give us a map that works for long range navigation. That's it. That should be easy. Long range navigation happens. Just use the information you can garner from that. Tiger Dan. Janusz Takas says, while I started watching Flat Earth debates, I learned celestial navigation, spherical geometry, and a little about surveying and a lot about history. What did Flurfs learn? How to lie. Chris Curtis Flat Earth says, good show tonight. Could have been better, but at least you were kind of nice. One of these days, you're going to be a... Fl no, Chris, I, I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> but thank you for this, the super chat anyway. Binge Thinker says, your NASA check was short $4.99 this week. We are sorry for the inconvenience. NASA payroll. And, oh, somebody had asked, what shirt am I wearing? Um, Well, there's an SA here. And there's an, oh, look, there's an A in front of it. And then, oh, look, there's an N in front of that. That's right. It's a NASA shirt. This was a gift uh, I from a while ago. And, uh, yeah, there it is, NASA. So, <clears throat> Uh, <laughs> I, I intentionally wear stuff to trigger them. I tell you when it comes to space agencies, space companies, space, com you know, entities that put things in space, NASA is not at the top of my list right. for, for success. It's hard to beat SpaceX and for watching, for providing something fun to watch this freaking starship is stupidly huge and how fast they are revving things is amazing um all right and here's a little aside in the 60s and early 70s nasa went to the moon right while they were on the moon for apollo 16 congress approved the space shuttle program and told uh the two astronauts on the moon um Charlie Duke and, and the guy that's not named Charlie Duke that was on the moon at the time were like, hey, cool, that's awesome. Not knowing that that spelt the end of the Apollo missions, right? They did 16, 17 was on the way. They did 17. They were training for 18 and they're like, nope. And then decades later, the movie Apollo 18 came out. 
A little creepy. A little creepy movie there. Um, anyway, then that, that meant that they went to the space shuttle. So from, you know, 1972 all the way through to last year, <coughs> um, 2022. How many years? Is that 80, 82, 92, uh, 2000, 2012, 2022? 50 years. 50 years from 72 to 2002 before NASA sent a human rated ship to the moon. Not a fan of that kind of delay. I understand why. Um, and then recently, the Artemis mission budget was analyzed by something, and they're like, "My goodness, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess." They they talk. It talks about the the cost of the five engines that are in the main rocket. I could be wrong in the details. Anyway, the cost of the five engines is like half a billion dollars. How many Falcon Heavy launches can you do for half a billion dollars? Like 25. So, and and all they're putting up is like half of what Falcon Heavy puts up as in, in mass. So, I'm, I'm going from memory from a, from a video I watched on WAY. What about it? I like that channel. Um, And, and, uh, so the the budget they could have done like 25 falcon heavy launches but they could have gotten the mass up for just two budgets leaving you 23 whole launches to send up just for the the cost of the engines something like that anyway <clears throat> um so yeah that, that and being a software developer doing this rapid development i love this rapid development I've always thought that was the way to do software and you know it used to not be so when when rational unified process and the, all these things came along. I'm like, Hey, finally, you guys are, that's, I love, I love it. Um, and that's what, that's what Sp SpaceX is doing. They're doing this rapid prototyping and development. And so what it, it blew up. Don't care. Let's send the next one. Send the next one. Send the, guess what? It works now. NASA is like, well, we're going to take 30 years and we're going to make sure it works the first time. It's going to be way more expensive, but we only set one up and it works. Awesome. Don't care. Can you get it done faster and cheaper? That'd be super. All right. End of the aside on on uh, on my, my NASA shirt. I I love it because it triggers them. But I you know they're not they're they haven't impressed me. The grumpy old mechanic says I missed the stream. Did either of these two want to take five hundred from me? Um, you know you might actually get Brian Leakey to take you up on that. So if you actually want a couple hours of Brian Leakey stumbling through reading abstracts of papers in a library, that five hundred dollars just might be something that would that could be done. I mean, I I, I think five minutes of that would be funny. <laughs> Jiffy Jiffwald says, "Sorry to have missed it. Welcome to Weenie Earth." Thank you for that. Two AHD cats says, show me that. So that was the picture of the TV of the the shirt that he made. Um, <clears throat> Vector says, if only Flurfs had enough critical thinking skills. If scientists had stuck to the very version of the scientific method pushed by Flurfs like QE, we wouldn't have invented computers yet, right? We could not basically invent every anything. The version of the scientific method that Quantum Eraser and, and Nathan Oakley talk about <clears throat> is so incredibly strict and dogmatic that you can't actually do anything. Um, and it's built on fallacies, right? It's built on the modus ponens um, because they, they think, you know, egg water, this is an egg. Uh, we, we put the egg in the water. It, it, um, it did not float. We put salt in it and it did float. Therefore, prove, right? If P then Q, Q, therefore P was proven. That's what they're saying in their, in their process, right? But the super rigid, first you must find an observ natural observable phenomenon. And the independent variables must come from that observation. 
No. The, the observe something in nature part of the scientific method that is given to middle schoolers is here's how you're going to write up your science fair project, little boys and girls. You're just going to write something that you noticed in somewhere happening. You just write that down. It's the introduction to your science fair project. It's going to go up on the top left part of your tag board when you put it up on the on the pay, on the table when you go when you go to the big city and and you're in the gymnasium in, in the school you've never been to before and your parent you're going to be wearing those clothes that you don't you only wear to church on Sunday and you're going to be so proud of yourself. That's what goes in the top left of that piece of tag board. That's what it is. It's this junior high mentality thing. Just children. That's what they are. Ah, uh, PhD Tony says, can they show a container not in a container? Jiffy Jiffwald says, Chris Curtis claims to have a model. Don't laugh. Chris, I know, has been trying to work on a model. He likes the one that's that's kind of boob earth, right? It's got the North Pole in the middle. That's got the little the little nipply top to it, and then and then the it curves down towards the equator. You got this this nice this this you know <laughs> and then on the other side it rolls up a little bit somehow i don't know about that the rolling up part of it he says that one looks good to him well i think a lot of people say that those things look pretty good to them so um do we have a link to the map of the triangulation says william foley um yes so it is uh, mc2.net slash se is where you can find the page. Oh my goodness. Um, I'll bring it up <clears throat> so you can so you can see it. So here's here's my page. SE for spherical access. <coughs> so this is where I started that whole um, spreadsheet. Was taking you know here here's the spherical access um, how it works. Here's several different surveys that list spherical triangles, and then here's the link to the spreadsheet. See so if give a clicky click on that. And it brings up the spreadsheet. There's the, the reciprocal zenith angle. And then uh, along the bottom here. Um, oh, you can't read it. Hold on. Let me get that. Because you're going to want to see it. Yeah, there you go. There. There you go. All right. So you see the tabs in the bottom? That bottom left says charts. You got excess per kilometer analysis. Um, I mean... It's such good stuff. It's, they have no idea how much detail is in there. They're like, it was a mile margin of error. No, it wasn't. Um, <clears throat> so if you look to the one that's TJ's, um, yeah, and a lot of these, if you see these start with Dell, they're, they're, they've been brought somewhere else. The data has been put into some other table and these, these tabs may be deleted. Um, and then there you go, TJ Sandbox. Of course, I don't know what he's doing in here. It's his sandbox to do whatever he wants. But there is there is the uh, spherical excess um, perimeter. And then where did he say it was? It was on the triangles tab. There it is, triangles tab. Scroll to the right. There it is, link to triangles on Google Earth. See that? You can give the clicky click there. And there it brings it up. <clears throat> so this this is this is really really cool because because it so shows the level of detail that they were doing. Um, how do I get out of here? There, no, nope. there, good. Okay, so th these. And you you didn't get this. Let me read to you Brian's words to me in one of the the questions. If level is curved using an auto level and pushing the distance limit of one hundred yards per shot, how would you lay out a straight line on land one mile long? One hundred yards per shot, pushing the distance limits of one hundred miles, one hundred yards per shot. The and he's said that. Because he's being lazy. So I talked with Larry Scott. And Larry's like, no, that's 300 feet. <clears throat> 100 yards. You wouldn't do that 
long uh, when you're doing differential leveling. This is what they're talking about. You wouldn't do that long of a shot. It's too long of a shot because you're trying to measure, you're trying to read on this, this stake, right? the stake in the ground, and, and you're reading on this stake somewhere of, of a measurement, and it's feet to tenths and hundredths, right? It's not inches. And you're trying to read to the hundredths of an inch or hundredths of a foot. But when you're, when you're at 100 yards out, even with the telescope that's on an auto level, you can't do that. You can't read that number very well. <clears throat> so you would not do that. But Brian Leakey wants to because he's lazy, right? He, to do a good differential leveling, you need to be precise. And in order to be precise, you need to be able to read the stinking measurements. So um, <clears throat> that's the point. They're being lazy. This is the opposite of lazy. This is not lazy. This is people spending real effort to go in and figure out the shape of the earth. This, I mean, this, this is to figure out the radius of the earth. Um, so, and they go, this little, this little uh, hook up here, this is to get to Salt Lake because because they did another baseline at Salt Lake. So you see the Salt Lake NW base, Salt Lake SE base. So this line here from 271 to 270 and back, they measured this using physical measurement, not just angular measurement. And this was the margin of error check, one of the many that they did. And today, this one, this is in a marsh. This is a, in a salt marsh. The, the, the thing that they built is gone. And this one up here is, is uh, not in a salt marsh, but it's, you know, the, the, the thing is not there anymore, right? A lot of these are, are not there. <clears throat> and this, this is interesting. The reciprocal zenith angles that they measured here, they needed to measure to a tower. They built a tower at both of these spots because you couldn't see the, un, unless they built a tower because both of these are right on the edge of the lake. This is, here's the lake right here, right? That's the, the lake. Um, and, and it's basically marshy and it's just, just a tiny bit above the level of the lake and the lake is curved. And so you couldn't from 270 to 271, you couldn't see the base. They had to build a tower. So when they did the, when they did the, the, zenith measurements they had to include the height of the tower they needed to know how high the tower was and then do the angular difference of that to to pull it down to the base of that it's one of the things that they needed to do so and it's really cool uh process they did they, they, i mean they, they weren't messing around just and they had a they had a mile margin of error no why why would you just lie this is so stupid. So dumb. All right. All right. Let me get back to it. Uh, Aaron Reese says, I built a flat earth model, but it was poorly supported and gravity destroyed it. <laughs> of course. Oh, all right. What did Bri Brian should clip these? Um, Brian agreed to modus ponens. And uh, Brian thought that uh, the transcontinental triangulation had a mile margin of error. Um, what else did he say? What did what else did he say? Was, um, yeah, when I asked him about what were reciprocal zenith angles, he didn't talk about reciprocal zenith angles. When I talked about uh, James Bradley's stellar aberration, he didn't talk about stellar aberration. Um, <clears throat> When he brought up a topic, he expected that I would present the information for his topic. <clears throat> um, the 24-hour sun in Antarctica, he said, oh, I'll have to look at it. Okay, I, I'll take that. The gravity challenge, he thought I was telling him that he needed to get big G. Like, no, you need to predict the acceleration. And you, can't, you won't let us use kinematics. Be well, kinematics won't help you. 
because all you need to do is it is tell us the downward acceleration that your model predicts but you don't have a model so you can't um <clears throat> uh anyway yeah modus ponens i love that he did <laughs> Oakley, Oakley's going to tear him up. Oh, it's never them showing evidence for flat Earth. It's only them telling you to show evidence. Yes, and then they say, no. -uh. I mean, I showed the curve of the Earth, and he's like, but two degrees, four degrees, two degrees, four degrees. Seriously. Um, so tomorrow, tomorrow at 4 Central Time, I am debating... Um, I'm debating Richard Wilde. And he posted on Facebook, who wants to debate about the Earth orbiting the sun? Me. So stellar aberration that we talked about tonight and the, uh, uh, some other some other things we will will go up. We'll, I'm sure he will have lots of measurements of stationariness, won't he? Of course he will, because that's what they always have. Never. It's what they never have. So, all right. <clears throat> um. Anyway, that's what's coming up tomorrow. Um. I'm working on. If you remember, Dearth, Dearth was in a classroom. Dearth was in a classroom. I've been doing some research with with uh, Industrial Nerd and with Bryant Myers. If you are interested in assisting in this research, um, message me on Discord. Let us say that if you're if you're if you're looking for a, a place to do some research on, message me on Discord. Are you gonna miss the astronomy one? Oh yeah, it's during the day for you. Um, yeah, it's, I mean it's gonna be stuff you understand, but I have um I. It's over there, but I've, here's what I've done. I've bought a couple copies of Einstein's book and, and when I've met two people now, I've given them or three, I've given the a copy of the book away. So I had a meetup um, in June and I met with uh, B Dazzle and I met with Pat in the chat and I gave them, I gave them a book. Um, and so the, I forgot your name. <laughs> Somebody said, will you send me something for my birthday? And I will. And I forgot who you are. I was, I ordered the book. So I have the book ready. I can ship it to you, but you're going to have to remind me who you are. I get messages on discord, uh, Facebook messenger, Twitter, <laughs> um, TikTok, and email and some other places too. Uh, WhatsApp. Um, I don't remember where you sent me a message and there's too many to that. I, I tried, I couldn't find it. So send me another message. I'll, uh, I'll get it sent off to you. Um, <clears throat> did people lose lives on this endeavor? What endeavor? What type of research? It's finding a person. I'll tell you that. Helping me find a person. That's what I'm, that's what it is. It's been a conundrum. Uh, it's been, it, yeah, it has. So anyway, people, thank you for that. Look for, look for, out for, uh, tomorrow, um, at four o'clock hopefully that uh, that comes together he he didn't respond to me yet today but uh, i'm i'm hoping that it happens anyway he seemed confident we'll see how it goes but anyway people thank you very much for super chats for patrons for channel members for supporting for liking make sure you like it for sharing it out um uh you know all that stuff helps and uh and i appreciate very much what when you do that so thanks a lot and we'll see you tomorrow